present in this room throughout the Congress will add to the diversity of knowledge and approaches in addressing some of the critically important issues of, humans, of all of these presentations. The metrics related to India, like much of the world, indicate very worrying trends, especially in terms of disaster management. And the International Displacement Monitoring Center, IDMC, reported 41 million internal displacements between 2012 and 2022, mainly as a result of floods, storms, and wet mass movements. In 2018 alone, there were close to 3 million displacements, mainly due to disasters along the coastline and adverse impacts of monsoons, triggering floods and crop failures. India recorded the first largest disaster displacement with two and a half million displacements according to the Global Report on Internal Displacement, GRID, GRID, 23 report. 93,000 new displacements were recorded in Nepal in the year 2022, and between 2011 and 2021 in that decade, 3.4 million displacements and 245 disaster events were recorded. So you can imagine the scale of this challenge. So coming to the session outline, uh, in light of uh, a range of environmental and socioeconomic factors resulting in migration, there has been an emerging need to have a look at this phenomena with a renewed perspective. And uh, you would also uh, men appreciate uh, the uniqueness of this session because we are trying to bring in a very important element of, of migration uh, linked to disasters. And let me take the opportunity to briefly share IOM's global work on the issue. IOM supports the member states' efforts to implement. We have around 175 member states, including India, to implement the priorities of the Sendai framework, which we heard when many of the speakers were talking about in the morning for a disaster risk reduction by preventing and addressing disaster-related population movements and by harnessing the value that mobility can bring to reducing risk and building resilience to multi-hazard risk. Addressing the migration and mobility challenges in the context of disasters and climate change is one of IOM's focus areas. Currently, some 25 million people are displaced each year by disasters. It's expected that hazardous events amplified by compound risk factors such as ecosystem degradation climate change, epidemics, pandemics, etc., will increase displacements in the coming years to come and compel millions more to migrate within and across borders. We are hoping to answer one key question through our session, which is how can multidisciplinary approaches contribute to climate-specific disaster management through risk reduction and community-based adaptation? To address response challenges based on a better understanding of human mobility, IOM's displacement tracking matrix, which we call DTM, is a system which regularly captures, processes, and disseminates multi-layered information on the mobility, locations, vulnerabilities, and needs of displacements, displaced and mobile populations throughout the course of a crisis. So when a crisis happens, we track the movement of migrants at every stage. Joining us from the IOM headquarters in Geneva is the DTM technical expert, Dr. Prithvi. She is sitting right here. She is based in London, and she is part of the global uh, 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 DTM team, uh, which helps uh, uh, assist uh, the IOM uh, operations around the world. So Prithvi will walk us through the DTM tool, and you will have great insights in terms of the concept behind the tool, how it operates, et cetera, and its methodologies, and provide us with examples of where the tool has successfully been used to derive insights in different countries. Following that, my another colleague, Ankita Surabi, who's also sitting here from IOM India, will make a short presentation on DTM's potential use in India. And I'm sure many of you will, will appreciate the contextualization of DTM in the Indian context. Joining us online is Ms. Himani Upadhyay, Future Lab on Social Metabolism and Impacts, PIK, Germany. 
uh, from highlighting the challenges and vulnerabilities associated with heavy out-migration and causes behind it based on very interesting research carried out in Uttarakhand just ar around one and a half years ago, jointly by PIK and Terry. Our session is enriched by the presence of Ms. Pam T. Thang Hang, who is the Senior Resilience Officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific in Bangkok. Ms. Pam will share FAO's understanding of the migration, climate change, and agriculture linkages and trends in Asia, and FAO's approaches such as vulnerability and risk assessment climate resilient agriculture that is in, integrated with sustainable natural resource management and anticipatory action. And amongst the speakers, last but not the least, would be Ms. Shabnam Shivakoti. Ms. Shivakoti is the Joint Secretary from the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development Government of Nepal, who will shed light on the Nepal case in the context of FAO's supported project on helping rural reintegration of returning migrants. Again, there is a very interesting intersection of migrant migration and climate change and disasters. And we are delighted to have Professor Menon, uh, who's going to join us soon after lunch, who has very kindly agreed to co-chair this session alongside me, and who will also steer our session towards understanding DRR in the context of population mobility dynamics which includes people who are unable to move, people who choose to stay. And furthermore, in India, IOM and FAO have recently begun a joint program for enhancing the resilience of migrant and vulnerable households in the cyclone-prone and aridity-affected areas of Odisha and Telangana. So my friends, we have an extremely interesting lineup of presentations and discussions this afternoon. So without further ado, Let's get into the sessions, but before I do that, let me introduce two key uh, colleagues who have also joined us. Uh, one is uh, uh, Professor Rajkumar Pant from IIT Mumbai. He is also going to be one of the panelists. And thank you for joining us, uh, Professor Pant. Indeed, a pleasure. We also have one of our colleagues uh, from UNDP, Uttarakhand. Uh, uh, I didn't get your name, I'm sorry. Pradeep Mehta is based in, in, uh, in Dehradun, and uh, he works with UNDP, focusing on Uttarakhand state. So, indeed a pleasure having you with us, Pradeep. So, uh, there will be a slight, uh, I mean, uh, uh, so in, because we had a slightly delayed start, we have rearranged uh, the speakers. And the first one we are going to listen to is Ms. Sabnam Shivakoti from Nepal. Then we'll have Ms. Pam from FAO in, uh, in Bangkok. Then we'll have Ms. Himani Upadhyay, who's connecting with us uh, remotely again. Then we have Prithvi, and last would be Ankita. And then, of course, we'll invite uh, Professor Panth uh, after these presentations are done. So over to... Uh, uh, Ms. Shabnam Shivakoti, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development, Government of Nepal. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Amiji, for giving me this opportunity on the first time because I had to an uh, attend another meeting, so I tried to switch in between the meetings. Uh, can I request to share the slide, my slide? Yes, the slide is on. You are going to open it or should I open it? Yeah, you, you, I had requested uh, the, you to open it, please. Because some of my, my this uh, laptop is not working <laughs> at the okay, moment. Okay, fine. It is open from my so end. I'm okay, thank you. Please. Uh. Yes. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, can, can I begin? Can I begin? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Amiji, and all the all the colleagues who uh, 
will be making presentation and all the panelists uh, thank you very very much for this opportunity uh, i came on board in this process uh, uh, <laughs> very late so uh, I'm, i'll just try to focus on the the topic that was uh, given to us uh, by the organizers to cover on so that we'll be sharing uh, the specific project intervention from nepal uh so i would also like to, to before i begin i would also like to thank uh, thakur chauhan who is also joining from fao and then uh, the project this was the project experience from the fao so uh, he he provided a lot of inputs how the project went because i was not directly engaged with the pro pro uh, project uh, so i'll be briefly touching upon the the overall scenario of the uh, the vulnerability in nepal and and the migration scenario uh, and then try to bring it to the experience from project and also uh, what are other measures that the government of nepal is uh, initiating to for the re reintegration of the migrant returnees uh, and then there's some key challenges that we face and probably the panel questions and we can discuss on how this can be this uh, we can uh, we can have the way forward for, for for this issue so just to give you the brief context of nepal in the in the vulnerability index as we know that the our region itself is very vulnerable is asia asia pacific region itself is very vulnerable and uh, the recent global climate risk index 2021 has also shown that nepal is among the 10 top 10 most vulnerable countries uh, to the impacts of climate change uh, and this is impacting uh, food water health ecosystem service human habitat and infrastructures among the sectors among few sectors uh next please nick yeah so when these uh, vulnerability is there due to the climate change shocks and these when shocks in addition to the vulnerability then the this will have a compounding effect on the livelihood of the people and we have recently seen this uh, during the pandemic covid-19 pandemic when many of the people uh, were further down into the vulnerability group Uh, and then the recent global ongoing global con conflict has also uh, aggravated the situation that the already vulnerable people are now getting into more vulnerability trap so i can you go back to the slide please no yeah Uh, so there is the the supply chain is disrupted and because of these uh, crises the cost of fuel fertilizer food is increasing and because of that overall agriculture production cost of production is increasing our competitiveness of the farmers are impacted and that is affecting uh, the overall trade uh, farmers income and because of this also many people are leaving the agriculture sectors so due to the vulnerability and or other various uh, um uh, uh, causes of the uh, migration that people are moving away from the agriculture one and also moving away uh, from internal displacement is very common uh, and if you look at the migration scenario in nepal we have seen that there is an increasing net migration rate if we look at the data from 2017 if the net migration rate was still negative but now if coming to the 2023 uh, the net migration rate is positive uh, and our contribution to the gdp from the remittances is is, is getting quite significant uh it's uh, even currently it is about 23 24% of our gdp comes from the remittances so migration for us is in in that sense is important uh but then how we kind of balance in between you know how 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 we can um uh, control the movement of the people and how to, how we retain the people um, affected by this vulnerability is is a very challenging at the same time uh, who, uh, the uh, for the migrating population if we have the skilled migrant population then this remittance is also again positively if positively affected so this both has to be uh, seen in in the context of nepal uh, so when we talk about this uh, uh, vulnerability how this climate vulnerability as a push factor is impacting the livelihood and migration this is very important to understand in the relation of reintegration next slide please uh next slide please uh, yeah so now i'll be sharing a brief from the the, the project experience from nepal which was a fao supported intervention and it was a uh, implemented in a short period between 2021 to 22 june uh the project was sustainable reintegration of migrant returnees in the rural economy and the, the particular focus of this project was on strengthening the capacity to harness a positive effect of migration in nepal so the project was located in a very one of the municipality in 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 one of the district in nepal uh the target beneficiaries were youth returnees migrant household households and vulnerable peoples about 327 households so this was a very small project but just it is this is to share the learning that how this can have an impact on the on the, on the community 
Uh, so the, this was implemented by the Department of Agriculture and the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development with the major objective to generate income, employment, and entrepreneurship opportunities in farm and non-farm sector uh, for the region migrants. So there is a couple of uh, um, activities were proposed in the where were implemented through, through this project. Uh, so in terms of partnership and implementation, we had a project study committee which would give the overall guidance to the project uh, in, in, in terms of project plan, activities and overall guidance. And then also the, the, the PSC was responsible for seeking the partnership and coordination with the other ministries because in our ministry, uh, in, our, in our country, Ministry of uh, Labor, uh, employment and social security separately deals with us uh, with especially with the my, uh, migration and then uh, works we works closely with the IOM in Nepal so in addition there are other ministries like Ministry of women children and senior citizens and other departments were also um, uh, were also consulted and coordinated during the project implementation so primarily we use the FAO tools uh, on on the reintegration of the returning to rural area. So the conceptual was, was from the design to the monitoring and learning. Uh, so basically we focused on the uh, skills training uh, in, through the project. So uh, out of the many uh, skill development trainings, um, the, the demand were from both agriculture and non-agricultural vocational training. training. So based on that, with the training was provided to the migrant uh, returnees. Sorry, um, so it looks like did I miss one slide here? Sorry, okay. So we had a rapid assessment of the the the, the, pro, the project site done, uh, and then looks like I missed one slide over another. <laughs> sorry, okay, sorry. I missed one slide here. Okay, so in the process, what we did was the rap there was a rapid assessment was done, and then the the, the need of the uh, migrant returnees were were uh, uh, assessed, and based on that, they were linked with the the, the production activities, linked with the f financing, linked with the market. Uh, and then uh, linked with the insurance. So there were several interventions. So after the, the training was given to them, there were several other interventions to, to join those uh, communities with the service providers so that they, they can the, the learnings, the trainings can be now in, taken up as, as an entre enterprise. Uh, so the, the key learning uh, to ensure the institution of this project was that there was a government ownership because the jointly the project was jointly planned from the beginning, and then some evidence-based policy dialogues and policy coherence were were um, uh, were tried to ensure that during the implementation, also with the local and province government, uh, there was a mobilization of the local partners were also in in, in the project, and then we we used the different guidance tools were developed for the sustainable economic reintegration uh, and then communication matters were de developed and process were documented uh, but after the present uh, you know the the project implementation so what has been the sustainability or continuity of those who who who's migrant uh, who took this training this is still need to be follow up because uh, the, the project has been recently uh, completed and how many of them are doing now is is, is very critical to to understand the sustainability of our approaches these are some of the pictures that we Keep training groups. So this range from uh, agriculture to non-agriculture uh, projects, non-activities. Uh, so when we look at the integration of the returning migrant worker from the government interventions, so the government has prioritized several integration of migrant workers through the skill development and certification. And also there is the program dealing with the financial literacy, literacy uh, vocational training. And then, uh, uh, can you go back to the slide, please? Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Next slide, please. I forgot to mention. Next, next slide, please. Yeah. So, um, so the Ministry of our the Ministry of Labor uh, and uh, Labor Employment and Social Security. So they have. Uh, uh, categorically prioritize the integration, reintegration of migrant workers through the uh, skill development and certification uh, through the programs dealing with the financial literacy, uh, vocational training, uh, recognition of the prior learning that they might have uh, learned during the their, their when they were uh, working as a migrant in the other countries, and then psychological logical support and shelter. So this has been the prioritized approach. And through the reintegration program, operation and management directives, which has been recently approved for the return migrant workers that was approved in 2022, the government has stressed three diverse uh, yet interrelated dimension of the reintegration effort. So that, that includes social integration of the re returnee, uh, employment, and then entrepreneurial development. And also uh, many province and local governments have focused programs categorically targeting the returning migrant and also returning migrant in agriculture. 
uh, in the re fiscal year 2021-22, uh, government has uh, categorically uh, made provisions uh, for the concessional loans, loans which are provided to micro, small and medium enterprises for the commercial agriculture, youth enterprises, women enterprises and, and persons particularly returning from foreign employment. So they are provided the subsidy loan uh, at the subsidy of 5% in the interest. Uh, similarly, there is allocation of the uh, fund for the skill development training in various uh, uh, range of subjects, so especially also targeting the workers returning from the foreign employment and those who have lost their uh, jobs at home due to the, these various, um, uh, due various uh, reasons. And there is a Prime Minister Employment Program also, which is restructured to a minimum of 100 days employment to the unemployed. And this unemployed includes both the returning migrants and, and, and other, other uh, unemployed in general. Uh, so there are some uh, uh, dedicated projects also focusing on the reintegration of the migrant workers. So uh, one is about is uh, through the support of the SDC, uh, conducted in two of the provinces. And there is there is the reintegration of Korea returning mig migrant projects, so especially those who who take the who has the skill trainings from the Korea as as a migrant worker. So they they the separate project is there to reintegrate them. Uh, in the past, there was a the project called Dakcheta, where the skills development of the returning migrants migrants in the construction, uh, agriculture, and tourism sectors were implemented. So these are a couple of the projects that are already in the in 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 this one. And but while implementing these, there are some key challenges also because what what we have observed is that understanding the push and pull factor of migration is very very uh, important because uh, when we talk about the regular uh, the, uh, the migration and and the migration due to the this uh, vulnerability due to climate change, uh, the the context could be different. So how this 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 has to be really understood i think to while while we uh, design the programs or any approaches uh, for example we had a very um, uh, huge flood melamchi in in melamchi area in one of the districts near to kathmandu so there was flood and debris flow and this displaced a large number of population from the place of origin and because they lost many of their agricultural land so they are also now deprived of their regular occupation that they were in, engaged in so how we integrate these kind of because this lot of migration also happened in this area after uh, after this this flood and every uh, miss miss shabnam if you can wrap it up in one minute time yeah this is my last slide yes okay. this is my last slide okay so, so that is uh, so. This is also very important. And another is about the disaggregated data on the returning migrant is also important because we do not have all those informations in hand. And then identifying the right skill and support services for them is very critical. Uh, and one of the challenges that we face during the implementation of these projects is also the retention of the returning migrants because once you provide them the skill training and then connect them to the different service providers, uh, but. help us to obtain the returning migrants. And sustainability of the intervention and its impact is also crucial. Therefore, the approaches that government of Nepal is taking on the social integration, entrepreneurial development, and employment is also very crucial. And especially in Nepal, in agriculture sector, this is very largely impacted sector due to the internal uh, internal and also uh, the, the migration abroad. Uh, because uh, many of the agriculture lands are now ab abandoned, uh, many uh, youth are not agri uh, attracted to the agriculture, so they are shying away from the agriculture. And so because of that, how to bring this youth into the agriculture sector uh, during the integration itself is, is also very important for us. This we, find, we face as a very challenge to the agriculture sector. And another is about the coordination among the three tier of the government, because we have the government at the local level also, and the federal government and provincial government. So how do we coordinate among the three tier of the government and interagencies because this is uh, the, this migration issue is uh, 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 kind of coordinated by the Ministry of L Labor, uh, and then we have a Ministry of Agriculture and many other min uh, Ministry of other ministries which are closely re related with the with the various needs, skills, and then the, the supporting uh, programs that are required uh, for the for the after the the training and other skills. How we continue with them and how we link that with the market is also very important for the sustainability. So I think these are some of the challenges that we have faced, but we have a very example of from the project that even in the short period, if right intervention is uh, is there, and then there is an uptake of those uh, activities um, uh, enterprised by the, by the community. Uh, but again, sustainability is still a challenge and a question, I think. So I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shabnam. Over to Sanjay.
Thank you, uh, Ms. Shabnam. Uh, it was indeed a pleasure listening from you. Uh, let me now invite uh, Ms. Hang Thi Tan Phan from FAO's regional office in Bangkok. Thank you, thank you, Sanjay, and good afternoon, colleagues. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you in this section. Uh, Secretary Shivagod uh, provided a concrete example of FAO project dealing with I mean, mitigation, climate change, uh, poverty. It's actually give a very good context for me to explain a little bit um, on the FAO approach to migrations, and particular in terms of promoting sustainable agriculture and livelihood, um, livelihood and resilience to make migration a choice and an opportunity for rural development. Uh, maybe to start with, uh, it's why FAO and migration. Ms. Pham, so I O M. Ms. Pham, yes. may, may I request you to make it a full screen display? Is it okay now? Yeah, that's fine now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, so just, uh, I mean, the first question is why FAO and migration? Uh, again, IOM colleagues can explain much more in depth, but if we look at the root causes of migration that are driving the decisions of people to move out of rural areas in terms of rural poverty, food insecurity, lack of employment and income generation opportunities, increasing inequalities, in, including in terms of access to land, waters and others, and the depletions of the natural resources to due to environment degradation and climate change, but also due to unsustainable agriculture development. Those root causes of migrations are actually linked directly to the, with the FAO ultimate goal of fighting hunger, achieving food security, reducing rural poverty, and promoting sustainable resource management. Um, this explains the vision of FAO in migration, that we support people to have sustainable livelihood and resilient to multiple shock and stresses, so that when they, when they have to decide whether to stay or to migrate, um, that is a very kind of like uh, informed decision and a choice. And when they decide to migrate, people are able to do so through safe, orderly, and regular channels with their countries or across the international borders. And when immigration occurs, FAO vision is that both migrants, their families, and the host communities will be able to maximize the benefits of migration and together address any negative impacts. Uh, so both host com um, community and the migrants will contribute uh, I mean, positively to rural development. Uh, with that vision and thinking, I'm looking at li livelihood and resilience, you can see that it is the backbone of the four pillars uh, of work of FAO in migrations, uh, including uh, like enhancing the benefits of migration, facility and rural mobility, minimizing the adverse drivers and, and boost alternatives, guided by the principle of inclusiveness, sustainability, managing complexity, and a range of tools that FAO developed. So I'm gonna go deeper into the question that Sanjay put up for the section is that how, it, I mean, are we doing integrated approach to deal with issues of, I mean, sustainable livelihood, resilient to multiple shock, multiple shock and, and stresses, and therefore helping making migration a choice and an opportunity for rural development. Now, so in FAO, our strategic program uh, up to 20, 2031, it's actually provide a framework for this integrated approach. So we set the objective after the, uh, the, the UN Food S uh, System Summit in 2021 to support member countries' transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, low carbon, and sustainable agri-food system, leaving no one behind. And we, we aim to do it through what we call in FAO as the forebearers, better productions, better environment, better nutrition, and better life. And I mean, with the four pillars, you can see that the only issue of agriculture, ecosystem, natural resources, uh, inclusive uh, rural transformations, nutrition are coming together. Under the four pillars, we have 20 program priority areas. And if you look into the screen, you can see that each of the PPA has something to do with livelihood and resilience. And I'm going to explain like the FAO approach in each of the better on how we in each better and bringing all the better four betters together, we address the issues of resilience and, and sustainable livelihood. 
So for better production. Now, the region is facing with huge issues of low productivities, but also very unsustainable agriculture intensification. That scout deforestation, ecosystem degradation, loss of biodiversity, climate change, carbon emissions, and also increasing inequalities that are again driving the vulnerabilities to climate change and disasters. So FAO is supporting but farmers, particularly small farmers, uh, and, and smallholder producers in applying climate smart, climate resilient agriculture in the cropping systems, in livestock, in inter. services to, to inform the better decisions for fertilizer. In practices. Now, together with this, it's a better nutrition because in the regions when in 2022, in 2020, that we have almost 400,000 people facing hunger and more than a billion people uh, facing with, with money under nutrition. And, and about 49% of the population in our regions cannot afford a healthy diet. If we take into updated costs of healthy diet into account. So nutrition is a crucial part of, of resilience and of sustainable livelihood for people. Nutrition in the context of climate change, in the context of increasing disasters, um, so we work on food safety, we work on reducing food loss and food waste, we work with biosecurity in, for example, our fisheries and aquaculture, and of course with the whole value change and engaging smallholders uh, in, the, in, in the value change for them to increase income but also to change nutrition behaviors, healthy di diet and consumption pattern. So, Again, nutrition is integrated into better production, shifting into more nutritious sensitive as nutritious crops or nutrition sensitive farming system. And also linking with better production and better nutrition, it's a, it's a better environment. So very clearly there is this kind of like uh, nexus between agricultural productions, the ecosystem degradations, biodiversity loss, water scarcity, uh, water-related disasters like flood and drought and other issues. So FAO, we are integrating community-based, for example, watershed management or community-based forest landscape restorations and, and eco, uh, ecosystem-based adaptation and disaster risk reduction together with the climate smart, climate resilient agricultural production. Uh, to Is management as part of the whole better environment and link with better production that FAO is doing. Last but not least is the better life, where we promote inclusive rural transformation, where the issues of empowering rural women, for example, through women and youth focus, uh, producer groups or agribusiness groups, through um, the use, I mean, the, the capacity of the women and youth in using climate information, agro methodology advisories, and applying in adaptive agriculture production and natural resources management, as well as innovative approach approaches in dealing with disasters like anticipatory action that use better forecast and early warning to predefine the type of action that can take place before the disaster hit, and 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 with pre-arranged, pre -agree, um, arrangement, pre agree finance. And, and our imperative uh, analysis, impact analysis of anticipatory action pilot in the region across many countries, Mongolia, Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and others, show that every $1 we spend on anticipatory action save like at least $2.5 
of disaster impact and the cost that people have to spend on response and recovery. So we work very strongly with ASEAN in developing and adopting the ASEAN framework on anticipatory action to change the way that we manage disasters, as well as to apply anticipatory action approach in social protection. So that social protection are going to be more shock responsive, more helping more with vulnerable people to disasters and climate change, and act better, act before disaster hits. So I stop here with sharing a few on FAO approaches and, and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Pham. Over to Sanjay. Thank you, uh, Hank. It was indeed a pleasure listening to you and also relating to the previous presentation done by Ms. Shiva Koti. Uh, we are now moving to another very interesting presentation uh, uh, by uh, Himani Upadhyay. Himani works for the, uh, for the PIK, uh, the institution in Germany. And uh, PIK had uh, partnered with Terry uh, on a very interesting study related to the migration phenomena in Uttarakhand. And uh, I'm sure many of our colleagues who are sitting here who work either work in Uttarakhand or come from Uttarakhand, they would uh, appreciate and this study was a very interesting mix of two different sets of analysis. One was the, uh, the rainfall and, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, the other technical data, which was done by a colleague from Terry. And then there was another element uh, related to the social aspects, the migration. That's where migration comes into picture, which was very beautifully highlighted by Himani. So without further ado, let me invite Himani uh, to, to come in and uh, share the key highlights of the findings. Imani, over to you. You are muted. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Okay, um, just a second. Let me make it full screen. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. My name is Himan Pathyay. Um, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak here and present some of the work that we are doing at PIC. Uh, so, PIC stands for Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research and it's based in Germany. And I'm going to be presenting some empirical research that we have done in Uttarakhand on um, sustained out migration and climate change. Uh, and I'm going to be focusing on staying uh, communities, which is one of the uh, subtopics of this uh, of this uh, yeah of this event. Uh, I would like to start by highlighting uh, the quote that I have in my title, which says "Limited people with limited options." So this is a quote from a 72-year-old farmer who was affected by both uh, sustained out migration uh, impacts and impacts of climate change on agriculture. And he said that we are not living a full life anymore, uh, like we used to in the in the olden times. And he referred to his life as a limited life, and his, the life of his community as uh, you know people living uh, a very limited life who have very limited options to better their um, to make things better. And I would explain why he uh, why he made this comment in the in the next slides. So I have organized my presentation like this to give you a brief introduction of the research that we have done, what questions we were exploring in which study area, the methods that are used and followed by discussion and conclusion. So uh, to give you an uh, introduction, uh, the UK government brought out the Foresight Report in 2011, which focused on global environmental change and migration. And it highlighted that staying populations are hidden from high level estimates, yet they represent a policy concern just as serious, if not more serious than migration. Uh, but till now, uh, almost a decade later, the literature has uh, failed to build an understanding of how climate change and migration impacts uh, staying communities. So less attention has been paid to uh, those who stay than to those uh, than to those uh, who are migrating. 
So I asked the question, uh, I, um, you know, uh, uh, raised these questions in my research that what are the existing processes of change affecting staying communities, not just climate change, but other processes of change, uh, which are affecting the staying communities? What are the perceived impacts of our migration? How do staying communities understand migration? And then I try to, you know, uh, present it to you. Uh, is migration good, bad or necessary? And how does migration interact with processes of change? Uh, and um, what is the cumulative impact on ability to cope with uh, climate change? Uh, so uh, moving forward, um, I, I did this research in Uttarakhand, uh, uh, which has a population of about 10 million. 40% of the population is migrant. About 1,000 villages have no in uh, inhabitants. Uh, 405 villages have a population of less than 10. 70% uh, of the population depends on agriculture, while 70% lives in rural areas. Now, migration is a livelihood strategy to diversify income, to adapt to the constraints of rainfed agri um, agri rain agriculture, which is for subsistence, and to meet personal aspirations. Now, as some of you uh, would, know, would know that, uh, you know, in 2017, the government of Uttarakhand set up a Rural Development and uh, Migration Commission, which is now called Rural Development and Migration Prevention Commission, uh, which came out with these statistics that, uh, you know, 42% of the migrants are aged between 26 and 35 years old, 70% of the people move, uh, you know, do internal migration, they move uh, from, say, the highlands to the lowlands. Uh, then the main reasons for migration are lack of livelihoods in the in the uh, in the hilly districts, the ten districts that are hilly in the uh, in Uttarakhand, and there has been a shift from a, say uh, temporary to more permanent and sustained um, out migration. Uh, now, from a climate perspective, uh, climate change is acting on the conditions of migration and, and it's becoming an important, important factor in people's uh, decision to migrate. Now, this map here outlines the projected uh, changes in temperature, in extremes, in impacts on agriculture, and uh, also presents the migration indicators and population density. As you can see, that hills, uh, hill districts in the north the west and the central part of the state are more affected and are, and are likely to face higher livelihood risks as majority of the population is dependent on a subsistence plains rain fed agriculture adding to the existing out migration uh, from hills to the plains district um Yes. So uh, what I did was I did qualitative research across 13 villages and four districts uh, where I interviewed uh, affected communities, local experts, um, also looked at the available data from different sources. And um, then I transcribed all that data in a software called MaxQDA. And uh, here are some of the, you know, the results. So, uh, as I said, that I looked at multiple processes of change that are, uh, you know, uh, operating in these communities. One is climate and disasters. Uh, so many people reported that their uh, mountain springs have become dry, which are the chief sources of uh, drinking water in these uh, communities, that uh, the rainfall patterns have changed. Uh, there's a reduced rainfall both during the monsoon and the winter season. There's increased uh, cloudburst and heavy rainfall events. Uh, it has become hotter than before. It rains either too little or too much, and the rain, rain is highly untimely. And uh, in the winter season, they, uh, people reported that there's reduced uh, snowfall. Uh, now, with respect to agriculture and livelihoods, um, people said that uh, they have gone from having uh, food storage or being food secure to becoming, uh, you know, having shortage of food. That uh, buying food in these uh, villages where I was interviewing people was a new concept to them. So now they have turned to buying few food. Uh, there was reduced agricultural output due to, you know, changes in rainfall um, for the past decade, increase in crop diseases and pests. People said that we don't have water to drink. In fact, I was uh, interviewing people in uh, one of the villages where an uh, old woman said that, you know, I'm waiting for someone to fetch me drinking water so that I can take my uh, medicines. Uh, other than that, there uh, many people reported that uh, the, now it has started to rain at a time when they do their post harvest ha harvest uh, processes, and all the all the hard work that they put in in uh, agricultural season goes to waste because it just starts to rain when they don't expect that it will rain. And another thing is that not everybody who lives in a village wants to be a farmer, so there's a waning interest in agriculture, especially amongst the youth. Now, with respect to migration, there has been a transition from a male specific to family uh, migration. So from early, males were out migrating, but now there's an entire family which is moving out. 
uh, from temporary to sustain permanent out migration, which has led to empty or ghost villages as they are popularly called in Uttarakhand, abandoned houses and fallow lands. It has also resulted in feminization of agriculture uh, and shutting down of schools and primary healthcare centers, essentially a retreat of the state from these villages. On, on the social aspect, uh, people reported that uh, there was, you know, they were experiencing this disruptive social ties, and the family structures were breaking down as uh, they were not as they were before. There was a de declining respect for local culture. Uh, many elderly people reported mental health uh, implications of migration, feeling of loneliness, uh, feeling isolated, not having uh, the community that was there uh, before, bustling community. And then the increased burden for elderly women. So earlier, uh, younger women, when they were getting married, they were uh, you know, entering these communities and taking on uh, household work or taking on more work, or the work was divided between the elderly and the younger women. But now all the work was uh, you know, uh, being uh, done by the elderly women uh, because younger women were out migrating. And I also kind of uh, observed that there was a lot of negative emotions for, uh, for the migrants in these communities. So I asked them, is migration good, bad or necessary? And as, as you can see on the slide, the um, majority of the people said that it's good. Some said that it's necessary. People said it's good and bad. And uh, while some really had no, uh, no comments on it. So why is migration good, bad, and necessary? So migration is good when it brings in remittances. It gives you an opportunity to, you know, have some, uh, make some money outside of agriculture, to acquire new skills. It strengthens the household income security and leads to upward social mobility, which is very important in these mountain communities. Like, uh, like the quote says that my son migrated many years ago and he's an engineer. He has a good job in Delhi. He earns about forty thousand rupees a month and sends me money on a regular basis. And that comes in handy. I, I have married of two daughters from that money. Uh, I use it to buy food, pay for farm labor. Not everyone in the village has that comfort. Now, migration is necessary in these communities because to, uh, so that they can adapt to the constraints of rainfed agriculture because there's a lack of employment opportunities for the hilly communities. There's lack of development and infrastructure, so people are you know, pushed to uh, out-migrate. Uh, then there's a the changing aspirations of the youth and uh, to strengthen household e economic security. Uh, like the quote says that, well, if people are educated, they have to migrate. What will they do staying here? There's no opportunity in the village, no jobs, no income. An educated person will not pick up cow dung in the village. They would want to go into the city and earn money. So they quit the rural life. It is also about status and the ideas of what is a success. Now, many people say the migration is bad because it leads to fewer people doing agriculture. It leads to a loss of community, leads to more tasks for women, leads to abandoned assets, uh, where elderly are living alone. Uh, it impedes infrastructure development. Like I witnessed that uh, there was a school, uh, there was a primary school uh, which only had two children. So there was a, you know, no teacher was interested in coming to these schools and teaching the children from the village. So they were forced to send their uh, children to another district or, or, or place where there were more children. It leads to changes in demographic structure and composition of that village. So it leads to a very imbalanced uh, uh, demographics. Uh, like I mentioned in the quote, that I have a piece of land which is fertile and, and well farmed. Now there's another piece of land next to mine which is fallow as people have out migrated and abandoned their land. So now all the rats, pests, invasive crops will come to my side of the land and will spoil my crops. So when people migrate, it is bad for my farming. But to just uh, to uh, quickly uh, conclude, uh, that while migration can help meet household economic needs, it does not result in long-term economic development in Uttarakhand. It, in fact, leads to crossing of certain social, economic, and ecological thresholds. It in fact, in Uttarakhand, out-migration leads to loss of labor, changing socio-cultural milieu, uh, loss of community, uh, which affects uh, people uh, negatively. And that, uh, it also affects their ability to cope and adapt to climate uh, impacts. So migration is both a cause and consequence of local uh, vulnerabilities and climate change impacts add to it. Uh, second, the remittances have been discussed uh, as an alternative source of finance, which can aid in uh, climate adaptation. But in Uttarakhand, climate adaptation is rarely the first priority of, uh, of, farm, of households receiving uh, remittances. So migration is unlikely to have success as an adaptive strategy unless development policy can address the underlying cause of climate adaptation. But in next to that, there is limited capacity uh, to adapt to valuable goods, especially elderly women and children. So these are the focus vulnerable groups which perhaps policy should uh, be looking at. Uh, 
the sustained out migration also affects possibilities of return migration. So imagine, um, imagine a village where uh, you know, there is a retreat by the state, uh, uh, the bank, the health centers are not functioning, and the schools are not functioning, which is perhaps the situation we should be looking at. So uh, then sustained out migration also affects possibilities of return migration. So imagine a, imagine a village where uh, you know, there is a retreat by the state, uh, the primary health centers are not functioning, the, the schools are not, are not functioning. Essentially there is a uh, you know, lack of basic amenities. So people who would want the return, they would just need to be checked uh, whether they would want the return or not. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so there is a need to model the needs and priorities of staying communities as such an approach would make migration work and maximize the positive impact of migration. Uh, the voices of staying communities need to be heard and represented in relevant policy and political processes because if neglected, it can lead to a mobility bias in policy where the agencies, needs and rights of people uh, who stay are uh, ignored. Lastly, I would like to you know, highlight that there is a need for more research of, on the impacts of migration for staying communities. That brings me to a, to a closure of my presentation. And in the end, I would like to thank all those communities who participated in my research. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ms. Himani. Uh, over to Sanjay. Okay, thank you, Himani. That was a very interesting uh, when, uh, presentation. Uh, we now move to uh, Dr. Prithvi Hirani. Uh, Prithvi is uh, our colleague in IOM, and she is part of the Global Displacement Tracking Matrix team, which I'm very happy to know that, Professor Menon, you are very aware of. In one of the previous conversations, you did mention so Prithvi was specially invited by us uh, to, 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 to gain a deeper understanding about this concept of DTM and how it gets deployed globally in very diverse settings, wherever migration is at play. So Prithvi? Um, while I wait for the presentation, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for having me. I've uh, been very fortunate to speak about DTM across the world, but it's my first time to talk about DTM in India, so I'm really happy to do it here with you today. Uh, I guess while we wait, I'll ask you maybe what comes to your mind when you think about disaster and data? What sort of data do you think one would need in a disaster situation? Please feel free to shout. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. What else do you think you would need? All right. And anything else? Oh, thank you. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And? Huh? Okay, good. We're, I was trying to get at this. We, we, we need to think about people as well. So, of course, exactly. So, exactly. So, uh, one second. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about one such system, which is the displacement tracking matrix. So the DTM is a program within IOM, and it is operational in over 100 countries since 2004. It was originally developed in 2004 as a, as a system to analyze and collect data on uh, critical information related to people, their vulnerabilities, mobility, as well as their needs particularly in situations where they were affected by a disaster or by any kind of displacement. Why is this uh, really useful? It is done so that this information can then be used to help decision makers 
and responders provide these populations with better context-specific uh, assistance. So here, just to give you an overview of the different operational presence that we have, you can see it's across the world. In 2022 itself, we uh, recorded more than or close to 45 million displaced or displacement affected populations. We have um, a global operational footprint across the country with a strong network of primary data collectors with more than 7,000 employees um, collecting data on the ground. And of course, um, we have various modalities of data collection and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. In my presentation today, I want to give you a bit of an understanding um, on what is the role of data in displacement and disaster context, as well as um, what are the methodologies that we use and some examples from DTM across the world in, in employing different methodologies and, and uh, approaches to collecting data on displacement and migration actually. So in terms of who uses displacement data, across the world, um, pr primarily DTM data is used for response to inform governments, to inform uh, IOM programming, as well as generally the international coordination actors in a country. This varies from country to country. Of course, in India, um, this uh, humanitarian coordination and response system looks slightly different. But broadly speaking, the DTM system uh, reflects interagency frameworks to ensure that the quality of the data that we collect, as well as the methodologies that we use, uphold uh, international standards, the, the tools and practices and processes that we, um, that we use since 2004 have been refined and improved over time. And you know, just here to list a few frameworks that they uphold. The other uses of, dis uh, of this data is, of course, broader than just response and governments. It goes to academia, it goes to technical specialists, it goes to researchers, and primarily the office that I'm based in London uh, focuses on ensuring the broad use of DTM data beyond just operations and response. So um, while DTM covers a whole range of uh, contexts, be, uh, you know, be that conflict, be that uh, disaster, today I'm gonna focus ex only on disaster because that's the, fo that's the focus of our, of our talk, but also to try and give you a flavor of how DTM has informed, be that climate change related migration or environmental factors that have uh, affected movements. So in 2022, Across the operations that we've had, we've had 29 countries that were informed by environmental and climate change related policy using DTM data. Um, in disaster response specifically, DTM supported 18 countries. And this is done primarily through uh, collaboration and coordination with government agencies like national disaster management agencies to enhance or engage with the ministry to collaborate and collect data together. So just to be very clear, DTM does not, does not collect data independently. It usually con collects data with governments. With, given the sensitivity of data, it's very important that um, there is a collaborative approach in this and that the use, storage, management, and the whole process across the data lifecycle um, you know, is, is with uh, the approval of the government. So here to give you um, an overview of the methodological components that we have, we have four main components right in the middle. You will see mobility tracking, registration, flow monitoring, and surveys. We use these to varying extents depending upon the context, the information need on the ground, and what is most appropriate for what is, is, the, is the need in that moment but primarily the data we collect is on population groups. So that's migrants, that's displaced people, people affected by uh, climate or disaster sort of events. We collect data on locations. So where are these um, sites of displacement or affected by flood, earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, landslides, those sorts of things. The conditions in those locations, 
the needs and vulnerabilities of people in those locations, as well as where are people going. So trying to look at human mobility more broadly, we also try to capture data on um, intentions, but as well as origins and destinations. For disaster response, the main methodology that is most relevant is in the top left corner on mobility, called mobility tracking. And this is usually done at, uh, at a community level and in a group rather. And the products that this then data creates is reports, online data, um, GIS products, interactive dashboards, and so on. But the core principles that sort of guide this data, that guide our methodology rather, is, is that we adhere to making sure that DTM is flexible. It's context specific. So in DTM in India, for example, would look very different from DTM in Ukraine or in Nigeria. It varies completely. It's highly user centric. So the methodology, the questionnaire, the focus of population groups and so on will be dependent upon um, what the needs are on the ground. All data is open source and public, so it's, it's all available on humanitarian data exchange. The previous plenary, uh, someone mentioned that there is a need for open data and more interoperability between data sets. So with, at DTM, we, we really do believe that. And um, all our data ensures that there are no protection risks, so the data is anonymized. There's no sensitive information that can make groups identifiable or put anyone at risk. Um, so, and there are protection mainstreaming principles incorporated. We also have, as today in the, in the inaugural session, someone was mentioning about disability. So D, within DTM, we have a whole module also on disability and inclusion to ensure that even people on the move and human mobility patterns take into account different types of vulnerabilities. And of course, a key aspect that has ensured the DTM since 2004 to 2023 is still relevant is that it is adaptive and continues to learn. And I guess over the years we've refined and this methodology has also evolved. But coming back to thinking about why do we need this data and why do we, like, as you mentioned in the room earlier, you know, you have data on infrastructure, you have data on loss and damage, how many buildings were destroyed, but a key aspect of thinking about planning or thinking about what, what we need in a situation of disaster is very important to remember that there are human beings that are most affected by this, and this is what DTM data tries to do. It's really people-centric, so the first few questions it tries to answer is, who is affected, how many people are affected, where are they, what do they need, what vulnerabilities do they experience, and what do they, want, what do they intend to do. This then helps us, or helps a government, or helps all the stakeholders in a country de develop an appropriate response plan, provide timely and rapid response, as well as ensures that you know, the, the assistance that is provided is what people need. There's no wastage, it's effective, and it ensures that those who are affected by a calamity, um, you know, get dignified and sustainable solutions to what they face. What this data also allows us to do over time is assess mobility patterns, trends, and changes, which can also be used for preparedness, resilience, and uh, taking a more proactive approach rather than a uh, reactive approach. And finally, and most importantly, it also helps us to effectively use the limited resources that, that uh, governments may have, stakeholders may have, and also effectively allocate funds. So if you know, for example, in a location that, or a displacement site, there are X number of pregnant women or X number of lactating women, then appropriate assistance can be delivered to those locations. So this here is uh, on the right hand side, you can see the map of uh, Ukraine where we all have DTM as well, which is done in close collaboration with the government. And that gives us the number of displaced uh, people 
by their administrative regions. So in India, we have states. In Ukraine, they have ramadas. And the darker the, the, numbering, uh, the, darker the location on the map, that gives you an in indication that that's where displaced people are concentrated. And this methodology um, is geographically based. It tries to put um, you know, dots on the map to give us an idea of where people are and what, how many they are. What its value add in disaster response is that it can be very easily deployed. The, it's very easy to kind of train people to collect and use this methodology, as well as cover a large geographical area. And it's very easy to adapt depending on the country and the context. And we've tried and tested this methodology in 120 countries, so we know it works. Prithvi, you have one minute to wrap okay, up. Okay, great. So this is just to give you an idea of what the geographical breakdown looks like. Imagine zooming in on a map. And in terms of disaster, we have emergency response, slow onset disaster, as well as movement projections. These are the sort of three broad disaster and uh, data related tools and uh, response examples we have. So this is the type of data we have. The number of people, their locations, what do they need in terms of accommodation, health services, food, um, and their locations here. So the map on the left hand side can also give you an indication of where are people and in relation here specifically, what are their needs related to accommodation in response to the recent storm in Libya. Here in the Philippines, where we work very closely with the government, um, and in, in, in the Philippines, the government owns DTM. Here what we have is over time, especially in response to the volcano that occurred, we can see that in the, in the different phases of post-volcanic uh, eruption response, the way in which uh, people move changes over time, and that, that gives you an indication of how. And finally, here in terms of a slow onset, when we look at uh, this example from Iraq, we have an over overview of climate vulnerability, looking at different factors, different um, types of events. So that's drought, increased water salinity, landslides, and so on, and how they affect mobility within the country. So we see that over time, people have started moving south because the effect of drought and uh, movement and human mobility is further in the north. And this is also like the value of doing assessments over time is that with every round of data collection, we understand how a uh, kind of phenomenon spreads. But I'll leave it here and if you have any questions, I look forward to them. Thank you. So we'll, uh, the last uh, to invite is uh, another colleague from IOM, uh, Ankita Surabi, uh, who's going to briefly touch upon uh, uh, the potential application of the concept of DTM in the Indian uh, setting. So that's where uh, I mean, we, are, we would be able to situate it uh, in, the, uh, in our perspective. So over to you, uh, Ankita. And I've been requested if you can further shorten the duration of your presentation because the other, uh, you want this? You want this? No, I think they're going to play the Okay. It's fine. Yes. Can you remove this? It's not 
बता सकते Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I will continue from where Prithvi ended, and on the at the outset, I would just like to mention that I'll be keeping this presentation super brief, and uh, we'll basically be in a way discussing and highlighting how DTM can be used in the Indian context. It is a tool at the end of the day, and we have yet to use it in India. So I would first like to say that one of the uh, like the incidents, the, cri the crisis that kind of exposed us to the importance of data was the COVID crisis. And it was during that time, starting in 2020, that numerous ways to collect, uh, assess, and use data came to light. For the first time, we also got to know how many migrants are actually moving within the country because there was a lot of interstate exchange of information happening at different levels, how and where migrants were moving at the state boundaries so that the state governments could actually respond to the crisis and house the migrants uh, as soon as they entered the borders, make sure that they were quarantined, uh, also make sure that resources are allocated at the right time and if it, they need to be quarantined, they can do so and also provide all the health, ne uh, health ne uh, related support that was uh, required at the time. Another thing that we saw was uh, for migrant workers, uh, I, I don't know if how many of you are aware of it, but in terms of providing them labor support, especially to the workers in the informal economy, the eShram portal was opened. This eShram portal is a portal uh, of the government of India where informal sector workers, uh, also we call them unskilled workers, or rather uh, how IOM categorizes them is as low-wage workers, where they can register themselves and essentially the state government or the, uh, the state government and the central government who's uh, banning the portal can get information about how many workers workers are available in different kinds of sectors and how they can be placed. So this is a way in which uh, during COVID data was collected and uh, essentially data was also utilized. In uh, 2022, I am also conducted uh, a stakeholder consultation with multiple stakeholders from different sectors, including the private sector, uh, the representatives from different state departments, so that we uh, and state governments to understand how and uh, how and in what ways they were able to uh, introduce and use some good practices that they adopted and developed during the COVID crisis, how they collected data and how they used it. So uh, this was just to highlight how data can be used and how how the Indian government has been approaching this. Another uh, point I would like to mention here is that the national uh, Disaster Management Authority at the time also developed a portal called NMIS, the National Migration uh, uh, Information System that was again uh, f was to be used by the state government so that they could share information about uh, the number of migrant workers who were coming at the borders and then where to place them as a result of whatever health needs uh, arose at the time. So we have a system in place where there is a shared understanding that we need data and we need the right kind of people to collect and use data. Um, I think there is a problem with the presentation, so I'm just going to talk about it. Um, this is the wrong, but it's okay, it's fine. Um, it's, that's completely all right. Since we're talking about DTM in the Indian context, 
the the technical information about DTM was already shared here. Uh, basically, DTM uh, is a tool, and we need to understand how that tool can be used in the Indian context. Now, uh, within India, we know, as Sanjay also pointed out, we have been struck by numerous disasters. I think in 2020, the NIDM, National Institute of Disaster Management, and the German uh, agency GIZ, they released a report which was on natural disasters, natural and biological disasters in India, and we found out uh, that um, in order of in order of hierarchy, floods, heat waves, uh, cold waves, etc. These were the these were some of the biggest disasters that were claiming human lives. When we are talking about uh, the cost, the impacts of disasters, there is usually the financial cost of it. And as we inquired from our uh, you know like uh, attendants or uh, attendees uh, to this uh, session over here, what do you understand? about interventions when it comes to disasters. We talked about infrastructure, we talked about understanding, uh, you know, like uh, how we can build it and uh, what support structures need to be there. But the human cost of disaster it is not just the number of deaths that happen, but also the way entire societies are impacted, not just at the time of the disaster, but for generations to come. And within India, we know that migration is one of the social realities which people have been undertaking for decades. It is a way to survive. It is a way to fulfill your aspirations. And this is also what IOM India does. Um, I will simply tell you uh, how we can use a DTM in the Indian context. We know, that, we know that India is one of those countries heavily affected by disasters, but it is also one of the countries which has a kind of ingenuity that people are naturally born with. Why? Because we have always lived in these, in these shared societies, um, in communities where there is a very strong community structure in place. People help each other, and I would like to use the word jugaad here, is something that we usually use, because we make do with what we have because it is essentially the resilience of the person who they have, which they have developed over generations and over years with limited resources that help them get forward. Um, another thing that we uh, like to do here in IOM is that every intervention that we plan with uh, needs to be sustainable, needs to be self-serving, and that it can outlast and outlive the financial inputs that are coming in from external sources. Having said that, I will quickly say how it can work in the Indian context to help understand mobility dynamics and thus help mobile populations. Uh, when we talk about migration, it is essentially not just the people who are moving, but also people who are staying back, especially in the households. Uh, the social, the socio-cultural context of the country is such that mostly it is the men who migrate, whereas the women, children, the elderly, or rather the dependents, they stay back. So how we understand migration is in the context of the household. There is a migrating household where the person who migrates is affected at the source and destination, and the person who and the person and people who are left behind in the household. So when we look at mobility dynamics and how to help mobile populations by using DTM, we can get data and understand of where the populations are located, how they are affected, what kind of needs are arising as a re result of changes in the climate. Um, secondly, facilitating movement through advantageous integration with ongoing safe migration initiative. IOM India works on uh, basically promoting safe, orderly, orderly and regular migration. And in doing so, we work with multiple stakeholders, um, the gov uh, government partners, community members, grassroots organizations, um, private sector, um, uh, migrant groups and all of this. So we have, we essentially try to integrate different stakeholders uh, and, and bring them together to address the problem from different angles, from, from multiple, uh, in multiple ways. So when we are able to get data on why people are moving, where they are moving from, and how they are moving, we understand what are the needs that are arising over there and how we can understand what resources are needed, tangible and intangible, to help them. Tangible is obviously financial resources, infrastructure, etc. The intangible aspect of it is the knowledge that arises out of these mobility dynamics, um, and also perhaps to understand what can help people stay. As I said, mobility is not just about people moving, but also why they are staying and why they, why they would want to stay. Uh, in many uh, cases, Ankita, we have found out... could you please wrap up in one minute? Oh, really? Yeah. Thank you. Um, can I get two minutes, <laughs> if that's okay? Um, uh, okay, I will just run through it. Essentially, these are, the, these are some of the points, uh, and they are kind of a recap of what Prithvi already said, uh, where and why we can be using data. 
can we go to the next slide, please? Um, the next slide, please. Sorry, we've left. Um, uh, okay, another another way in which we can actually use DTM is to get disaggregated data. Um, as we understand, whenever there is a crisis that unfolds, there is a scramble to go and fix the damage. So we want to avoid the patchwork. Uh, you know the like you know the patchwork that happens whenever we are scrambling to uh, get resources and provide support, but rather have a preparedness in place. There was a time when all of the disasters and crises were completely unpredictable, but in a way, as technology has advanced, we can in a way predict some disasters, and also learn from the ones that have happened before. So we know that in many situations, women, children. Um, Pregnant women or lactating mothers are the ones who are most impacted. So, if there is, uh, if there is, a, you know, a support or resource that has been allocated in a particular area to provide support to the people who are there, including the migrants, um, if we have information of how many pregnant women are there, how many children are there, how many adolescents are there, lactating mothers, the resources and the money that has been, uh, you know, like provided in that direction can be used in a more judicious manner. Um, this is more, these are more technical components which Prithvi had already discussed. Can we go forward, please? Uh, just, to, just to give you a visualization also here, uh, during the Nepal earthquake where India also played a very important and strategic role in supporting the country to overcome uh, the aftermath of the disaster, helping populations. We also know Nepal and India share a very porous border. So these, are some of, these were some of the areas in which IOM's DTM uh, tool was used to understand where the people have been uh, displaced or relocated and how they are moving within this within the system the way to do DTM also is to understand it over a period of time so how we use the tool is uh, we have uh, different phases of a DTM phase one two three four five and we do it over a period of time so we can understand how populations have moved uh, either within the area outside the area have they moved outside the state or the country or have they come back so DTM can also help us understand how many people have returned which is something we can understand in the context of COVID because there were a number of people who returned back uh, to their villages and came back to the countries and there was a huge reintegration program uh, in place which states had adopted. If we have data about how many people have returned and what kind of, you know, um, uh, essentially resources are needed to help them, DTM can help us understand that as well. Um, uh, I would like to also lastly state that uh, IOM has been working on, on a project where we are trying to essentially help enhance the resilience of migrant and vulnerable households. And this is a project that we program that we have uh, recently launched with the Food and Agricultural Organization uh, in India. And it looks at two regions, mainly the coastal region of Orissa and some of the uh, aridity affected areas of Telangana. So there are two different geographies with two different very two uh, very different uh, issues pertaining to climate change. But the challenges faced by the local population are, are the same, where they might be moving or compelled to move under situations that might not be most advantageous to them. So um, Ankita, again, we will be we using short of time DTM for that. Um, lastly, I would just like to, can you go to the last, next slide, please? Yes, uh, I just want to highlight the role of partners and stakeholders. As Prithvi mentioned, we need to have key info, uh, we need to have like a, a strong stakeholder and partner base in order to collect uh, the correct data and to be able to use that data. And IOM, is also, uh, IOM also has in-house expertise in being able to assess that data, get insights, and then share it with the right people at the right forum, which can be used over a period of time to inform policy, advocacy, and intervention. That was my very short presentation. Thank you for your time. Bye. So please, I'm sure all of you would agree it was a very interesting lineup of very wide variety of presentations. So uh, before I invite uh, Professor Menon for uh, his closing remark as uh, the co-chair, uh, may I take this opportunity to invite uh, uh, Professor Panth from IIT, uh, who very kindly joined us uh, uh, throughout the session. Uh, Professor Panth, over to you, please. Very good afternoon, rather evening, to all the people. 
my role today is more of a rapporteur who will try to sum up very briefly what we <coughs> heard and uh, learned today. So our session started a bit late because of the backlog of the previous session. Uh, we started with a talk from a lady from Nepal who spoke to us about how the <coughs> Nepalese government has uh, handled the issue of uh, providing assistance to the <coughs> unfortunate people who have been displaced or dis uh, disrupted the lifestyle because of the disasters and there is a important lesson to learn from there because um, disasters do happen some man-made most natural but the way in which we look after our displaced people post the incident is also very important so we then had a nice presentation from a lady from uh, i just note down uh, you know uh, miss fam from uh, bangkok and she also touched upon, uh, <coughs> she touched upon the experience uh, and also highlighted how disaster management strategies can be incorporated. Um, we then had a very interesting presentation by Himani Upadhyay, who uh, while living in Germany has done a study on the displacement of people from various villages in Uttarakhand. And it was a very interesting uh, and very, um, you know, <clears throat> I would say, um, stole stirring kind of a knowledge that she passed on about the reasons why people migrate and uh, why they don't stay and how, you know, the communities that remain behind mostly are the ones that are forceful, something that Ankita also uh, highlighted in her presentation. After that, we had two interesting presentations by the two young ladies, Prithvi and Ankita from IOM. Uh, Prithvi spoke to us about how this tool DTM has been uh, used all over the world and how it, she highlighted its abilities, its features, and how it can be used in disaster management planning and in tra tracking how <clears throat> when people migrate for various reasons how to keep a track on their movements and how to use the data to plan rehabilitation and also to plan for the welfare of the people who have moved out. Uh, she also mentioned that this tool has not yet been used in India and then later on Ankita in the limited time available to her tried to run through very quickly uh, on the capabilities of this tool and uh, showed us how it can be useful uh, to apply in our own country. She presented two examples very briefly, one on Nepal, uh, how it was used uh, post the earthquake, and also there was a small section about post-COVID uh, <coughs> disaster, uh, post-COVID management in, I think it was in Thailand. So, um, so friends, we had a very nice uh, session where the speakers, despite the shortage of time, were able to stick to the specific points and uh, enlighten us about their own approaches, their own views, their own work, and uh, <clears throat> disaster mitigation. See, disasters will happen, as I mentioned, some are man-made, and some of them are natural. The, the key thing to learn from a disaster is to actually how to avoid complications in the next disaster. Because when we learn from disasters, and we develop strategies, and we use tools like probably like DTM, etc. in our planning, we are ready for the next disaster. Okay, so we are standing in a state which is a Himalayan state and uh, the whole context of this particular conference is to make Uttarakhand disaster resilient. And in that attempt, definitely it's very important for us to know about experience from other countries as well as about tools such as DTM which might be useful to us. So that's all. I, I mean, I don't have much uh, experience myself in disaster management, except that as an aerospace engineer, I did some work a few years ago for the Uttarakhand government on providing post-disaster communication systems and uh, using a balloon, a simple device where you can attach <coughs> systems and raise them up. And this was presented by me in the fourth WCDM, which was held in IIT Bombay. So since that time, I've been very much interested in looking at uh, disaster preparedness and post-disaster activities. 
So I'd like to thank Professor Menon for, uh, and the other gentlemen uh, to give me the scope, uh, the, the mandate here to come and talk to you. Thank you so much and a very good evening to all of you. Thank you indeed, uh, Professor Pant. It was an excellent summary of uh, all the presentations. And uh, when, uh, we all really were able to go back to uh, the key messages coming out of those presentations. <clears throat> so without waiting further, uh, let me invite Professor Menon for his closing remarks as uh, the co-chair. And then he has to rush to the next session as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, you know, one of the most important uh, issues uh, in any uh, disaster typology which you are familiar with in whichever part of the world where you come from is the fact that uh, uh, anytime anything can happen anywhere, okay? And that's the bottom line of disasters. So with disasters, uh, climate change, extreme events and conflicts, we are seeing that... Uh, you know, the uncertainty of events happening, which could actually paralyze livelihoods, uh, you know, overwhelm communities and other stakeholder groups, and, uh, you know, even destabilize economies. We have seen that in many parts of the world, in many countries. And we've also seen internal displacement and refugees, you know, in many countries, in many contexts, and we are also witnessing it now in terms of uh, what happened in Europe two years ago when you know, people were leaving from many of the countries and then you know, seeking asylum in other countries in Europe. And so we know that you know, there are these kind of situations. So disable, uh, you know, the displacement is actually a challenge which many organizations have to grapple with. And I'm very, very happy that uh, IOM, the displacement tracking metrics has now reached to 122 countries. If you look at uh, the global pandemic, COVID-19, it had actually, you know, affected 226 countries. And, you know, so which means basically that, uh, you know, out of several billion people, 8 billion people on the planet Earth, you know, you find that uh, there is a possibility that a, a, a disaster like, uh, you know, a pandemic could actually reach and then, you know, really cripple community livelihoods, lives, and also create uh, this kind of a problem. And we've seen that in whether it is in Afghanistan, whether it is in Iraq, or whether it is in, in South Sudan, or in Rwanda, or you know, what's happening in some of the countries in Africa. You know, we realize that this is a problem which we have to understand. And Kofi Annan had once mentioned that uh, you know, disasters and terrorism are two problems without passports you know and passports cannot recognize that kind of a distinction and borders cannot distinguish between these kind of issues because you know the displacement will actually happen and we've seen that in many contexts when displacement is actually happening so the displacement tracking metrics is very important because disasters climate change extreme events and conflicts and these are four you know events which actually happen without any warning you know and we have not been really successful in terms of looking at early warning for earthquakes and so you know there are efforts happening in many parts of the world where people are looking at uh, possible tracking of uh, seismic activity and monitoring and so on but however you know if something like that happens the problem is that when families get separated and you know you really have no control and so there is this issue of displacement which is actually also creating problems when we have the war in ukraine we had people who were actually you know families got separated and so they were going to poland or or slovakia or you know uh, macedonia and many many countries where you know ultimately there's no way in which you can actually track the movement of people so there is a need for looking at displacement tracking and in Kerala, actually, the Kerala government <coughs> has uh, come up with uh, uh, a tool called D DCAT. It's a DCAT, which is uh, a disaster risk reduction and uh, climate action tracking tool. And this is very much needed. You know, we need to really look at convergence of disaster risk reduction and climate uh, change, which is actually happening because we really don't have control on 
these two uh, disaster typologies and also climate change induced hydrometeorological disasters. So whether it is, uh, you know, floods or drought and also the fact that, you know, you can have the sea level rise and you can have the global warming and we've been all talking about 1.5 degrees, but the, one of the recent reports talked in terms of, you know, 2.9 to 3.9. And this is actually challenging that, you know, we need to really look at an energy transition. We need to really look at, uh, you know, conversion to fossil fuels, from fossil fuels to non-renewable energy and so on. And these are all issues. But uh, ultimately, I think most important is people-centered solutions. And so I'm very happy that, you know, you have been working IOM has been working with, uh, you know, countries affected by conflicts in many, many continents, actually. And we really feel that the Rohingya refugees, you know, who have gone from Myanmar to Bangladesh, and then they've been living there. Uh, people from Afghanistan have been coming to Pakistan and then, you know, going to many countries. And, you know, people have got married. Children have got married. And then, you know, you've actually continued for, you know, decades. So this is actually a problem which needs to be addressed. And so IOM has been one of the leading organizations looking at that, along with, uh, uh, you know, the migration monitoring institutions around the world, and also institutions like the Norwegian Refugee Council and, you know, many other refugee councils like the Danish Refugee Council and so on. So I think it's very important that we have this kind of collaborations and partnerships. And I would like to assure support of, uh, you know, all of you need to get involved and then there is a need for also crowdsource solutions. So it was mentioned by Prithvi that, you know, we are also looking at focus group discussions and also solutions by looking at uh, key informant interviews. And we need to really look at uh, crowdsource solutions much more because I think that is very much needed. Because data is a missing element. And we have seen that even during the COVID, you know, we did not really have the data of the migrant movements migration of people who were, you know, workers in many states who were moving across the country, going back to the villages because of the, the lockdown. So I think these are important that, you know, we need to really look at tools and now technology can provide us solutions. We can also look at, uh, you know, monitoring what is happening before, during and after a disaster or an extreme event. I would like to thank Mr. Sanjay Awasti, the head of office of the IOM, and all the colleagues from IOM, and also for giving me this opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. With uh, the very encouraging remarks uh, from Professor Menon, uh, we come to the end of this session. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for this interesting lineup of speakers and thanks to the speakers, uh, the two who are present here, Prithvi and, uh, and Ankita, thank you for, uh, uh, for making those excellent presentations and I'll separately thank uh, the other contributors. Uh, thank okay. you. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, before we conclude the session, may I request Alok to give a token of love from the organization, from the organizer, to Professor Menon first, to Mr. Sanjay Awasti, to Professor Pant, to Miss Prithvi. and to Ms. Ankita. And with this, we conclude the session. Thank you very much to everyone who joined us to make it a successful session. Thanks a lot.
हजारों वर्षों से भारतीय मनीषा का मूल मंत्र रहा है एक मंत्र जो पूरे विश्व के लोगों को एक परिवार बनाता है इस समय हमारा विश्व परिवार क्लाइमेट चेंज और ग्लोबल वार्मिंग से होने वाली समस्याओं और आपदाओं से घिरा हुआ है इस विषय पर चिंतन करने और समाधान ढूंढने के लिए महान हिमालय की धरती उत्तराखंड के देहरादून में इस वर्ष 28 नवंबर से पहली दिसंबर तक सिक्स वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑफ डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट का आयोजन किया जा रहा है गौरवशाली राष्ट्र के निर्माण और विश्व कल्याण के लिए प्रतिबद्ध माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी को धन्यवाद और उत्तराखंड के युवा दूरदर्शी मुख्यमंत्री श्री पुष्कर सिंह धामी को शुभकामना साथ सोचेंगे साथ लड़ेंगे और साथ जीतेंगे धन्यवाद वसुधैव कुटुंबकम हजारों वर्षों से भारतीय मनीषा का मूल नमस्कार मैं हूं पुष्कर सिंह धामी मुख्य सेवक उत्तराखंड भारत हमेशा से ही वसुधैव कुटुंबकम का प्रतीक रहा है हाल ही में संपन्न हुआ जी ट्वेंटी सम्मेलन इसी भाव को आगे ले जाने का सफल प्रयास रहा है जिसका श्रेय माननीय प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी को जाता है इसी प्रयास को आगे बढ़ाते हुए उनके द्वारा दिखाए गए मार्ग का अनुसरण करते हुए उत्तराखंड राज्य 28 नवंबर से 1 दिसंबर 2023 तक सिक्स वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑन डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट का आयोजन कर रहा है आपदा एवं वैश्विक चुनौती है इसलिए इसके प्रबंधन के लिए भी पूरे विश्व को एक मंच पर एक साथ आना होगा नए तरीकों पर बात करनी होगी अपने अनुभव साझे करने होंगे और ये सब करने के लिए हिमालय की गोद से अच्छी जगह और क्या होगी क्योंकि सदियों से खड़े ये अडिग हिमालय ही तो हैं जो विश्व को धर्म का ज्ञान अध्यात्म और योग का पाठ पढ़ाते हैं तो आइए और सिक्स वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑन डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट में सम्मिलित हों और आपदा प्रबंधन में भागीदार बने धन्यवाद नमस्कार मैं हूं पुष्कर सिंह धामी मुख्य सेवक उत्तराखंड गौरवशाली राष्ट्र के निर्माण और विश्व कल्याण के लिए प्रतिबद्ध माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी को धन्यवाद और उत्तराखंड के युवा दूरदर्शी मुख्यमंत्री श्री पुष्कर सिंह धाम को शुभकामना आइए और सिक्स वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑन डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट में सम्मिलित हों और आपदा प्रबंधन में भागीदार बने साथ सोचेंगे साथ लड़ेंगे और साथ जीतेंगे गौरवशाली राष्ट्र के निर्माण विश्व कल्याण के लिए प्रतिबद्ध माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी को धन्यवाद और उत्तराखंड के युवा दूरदर्शी मुख्यमंत्री श्री पुष्कर सिंह धाम को शुभकामना और सिक्स वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑन डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट में सम्मिलित हों और आपदा प्रबंधन में भागीदार बने
साथ सोचेंगे साथ लड़ेंगे और साथ जीतेंगे नमस्कार मैं हूं अमिताभ बच्चन उत्तराखंड एक प्रतीक है ज्ञान का योग का धर्म चेतना का सुविचार का और अब इन सब के साथ उत्तराखंड प्रतीक होगा साइंस और टेक्नोलॉजी फॉरवर्ड प्लानिंग सिक्स्थ वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑफ डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट देहरादून में 28 नवंबर से पहली दिसंबर 2023 तक हो रही जहां देश विदेश के वैज्ञानिक विशेषज्ञ आपदा प्रबंधन के नए तरीकों पर बात करेंगे और समस्याओं का हल निकालेंगे आपदा किसी अकेले की नहीं सबकी साझी तो उससे लड़ने में जरूरी सबकी भागीदारी धन्यवाद नमस्कार नमस्कार मैं हूं अमिताभ बच्चन उत्तराखंड एक प्रतीक है ज्ञान का योग का धर्म चेतना का सुविचार का और अब इन सब के साथ उत्तराखंड प्रतीक होगा साइंस और टेक्नोलॉजी फॉरवर्ड प्लानिंग सिक्स्थ वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑफ डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट देहरादून में 28 नवंबर से पहली दिसंबर 2023 तक हो रही जहां देश विदेश के वैज्ञानिक विशेषज्ञ आपदा प्रबंधन के नए तरीकों पर बात करेंगे और समस्याओं का हल निकालेंगे आपदा किसी अकेले की नहीं सबकी साझी तो उससे लड़ने में जरूरी सबकी भागीदारी धन्यवाद नमस्कार नमस्कार मैं हूं अमिताभ बच्चन उत्तराखंड एक प्रतीक है ज्ञान का योग का धर्म चेतना का सुविचार का और अब इन सब के साथ उत्तराखंड प्रतीक होगा साइंस और टेक्नोलॉजी फॉरवर्ड प्लानिंग सिक्स्थ वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑफ डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट देहरादून में 28 नवंबर से पहली दिसंबर 2023 तक हो रही जहां देश विदेश के वैज्ञानिक विशेषज्ञ आपदा प्रबंधन के नए तरीकों पर बात करेंगे और समस्याओं का हल निकालेंगे आपदा किसी अकेले की नहीं सबकी साझी तो उससे लड़ने में जरूरी सबकी भागीदारी धन्यवाद नमस्कार नमस्कार मैं हूं अमिताभ बच्चन उत्तराखंड एक प्रतीक है ज्ञान का योग का धर्म चेतना का सुविचार का और अब इन सब के साथ जय हिंद प्राकृतिक आपदाएं हमेशा से ही पूरे विश्व और मानवता के लिए एक चुनौती रही है जिसके प्रबंधन एवं समाधान पर मंथन एवं चिंतन करना जरूरी है उत्तराखंड ने कई बार प्राकृतिक आपदाओं का सामना किया है और हमारे बेहतर प्रबंधन और सामूहिक प्रयासों से हमने हमेशा ही अपने राज्य को इससे उभारा है इन्हीं प्राकृतिक आपदाओं के बेहतर प्रबंधन और नए प्रयासों पर मंथन करने के लिए 28 नवंबर से पहली दिसंबर 2023 तक सिक्स वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑन डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट का आयोजन देहरादून में किया जा रहा है जिसमें दुनिया भर के वैज्ञानिक और चिंतक आकर अपने विचार रखेंगे इस सम्मेलन का आयोजन न सिर्फ आपदा प्रबंधन के क्षेत्र में मील का पत्थर साबित होगा बल्कि उत्तराखंड में आयोजित होने जा रहे ग्लोबल इन्वेस्टर समिट 2023 पे आ रहे दुनिया भर के इन्वेस्टर्स के बीच सेफ इन्वेस्टमेंट रेजिलियंट उत्तराखंड की इमेज को भी मजबूत करेगा मैं आप सभी को आमंत्रित करता हूं कि आप उत्तराखंड में आए और सिक्स वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑन डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट का हिस्सा बने
जय हिंद प्राकृतिक आपदाएं हमेशा से ही पूरे विश्व और मानवता के लिए एक चुनौती रही है जिसके प्रबंधन एवं समाधान पर मंथन एवं चिंतन करना जरूरी है उत्तराखंड ने कई बार प्राकृतिक आपदाओं का सामना किया है और हमारे बेहतर प्रबंधन और सामूहिक प्रयासों से हमने हमेशा ही अपने राज्य को इससे उभारा है इन्हीं प्राकृतिक आपदाओं के बेहतर प्रबंधन और नए प्रयासों पर मंथन करने के लिए 28 नवंबर से पहली दिसंबर 2023 तक सिक्स वर्ल्ड कांग्रेस ऑन डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट का आयोजन देहरादून में किया जा रहा है जिसमें दुनिया भर के वैज्ञानिक डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट इज अबाउट सेविंग लाइफ एंड प्रोटेक्टिंग लाइवलीहुड एंड टू इंश्योर दैट वी नीड टू पुल नॉलेज the best practices both traditional and latest and use the green and cutting edge technology in everything we do in most of the cases we cannot stop natural disasters but what we can do is we can arm ourselves with knowledge and technologies using such power of knowledge and technologies we can create resilient infrastructure mitigate and manage propensity of disasters and save lives and livelihoods With this objective in mind we are organizing the 6th World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th November to 1st December 2023. This congress will unfold in the heart of Uttarakhand. In the face of adversity it is our rallying point a global congregation of experts and visionaries uniting to learn collaborate and share their vital tested wisdom. I call upon everyone to join us as they go to Uttarakhand host the 6th World Congress on Disaster Management. Disaster management is about saving lives and protecting livelihood and to ensure that we need to pool knowledge the best practices both traditional and latest and use the green and cutting edge technology in everything we do in most of the cases we cannot stop natural disasters but what we can do is we can arm ourselves with knowledge and technology using such power of knowledge and technologies we can create resilient infrastructure mitigate and manage propensity of disasters and save lives and livelihoods with this objective in mind we are organizing the 6th world congress on disaster management from 28th november to 1st december 2023 this congress will unfold in the heart of uttar in the face of adversity it is our rallying point a global congregation of experts and visionaries uniting to learn collaborate and share their vital tested wisdom i call upon everyone to join us as they go to uttarakhand host the 6th world congress on disaster management <laughs> <laughs> Disaster management is about saving lives and protecting livelihoods and to ensure that we need to pool knowledge the best practices both traditional and latest and use the green and cutting edge technology in everything we do In most of the cases we cannot stop natural disasters but what we can do is we can arm ourselves with knowledge and technology using such power of knowledge and technologies we can create resilient infrastructure mitigate and manage propensity of disasters and save lives and livelihoods With this objective in mind we are organizing the 6th World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th November to 1st December 2023 This congress will unfold in the heart of Uttarakhand. In the face of adversity, it is our rallying point, a global congregation of experts and visionaries and share their vital tested wisdom. I call upon everyone to join us as they go to Uttarakhand host the 6th World Congress on Disaster Management. Disaster management is about saving lives and protecting livelihood and to ensure that we need to pool knowledge the best practices both traditional and latest and use the green and cutting edge technology in everything we do in most of the cases we cannot stop natural disasters but what we can do is we can arm ourselves with knowledge and technology 
Using such power of knowledge and technologies, we can create resilient infrastructure, mitigate and manage propensity of disasters, and save lives and livelihoods. With this objective in mind, we are organizing the 6th World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th November to 1st December. I am uh, Durgeshwar, Director General, Uttarakhand Science and Technology Council, UCOST Dehradun. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action, and science and technology centric disaster management systems. <laughs> In Uttarakhand Dev Bhumi, we are organizing the 6th World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th of November to 1st of December. This 6th World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those are working in different domains of disaster management, so they will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where everybody will deliberate, where every one will come together and put forward a comprehensive viewpoint with regard to disaster management, its resilience and action plan too. Do come over. Thank you so much. Namaskar. I am uh, Durgeshwar, Director General, Uttarakhand Science and Technology Council, UCOST Dehradun. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action, and science and technology centric disaster management systems. In Uttarakhand Dev Bhumi, we are organizing the sixth World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th of November to 1st of December. This sixth World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those are working in different domains of disaster management. So they will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where everybody will deliberate, where every one will come together and put forward a comprehensive viewpoint with regard to disaster management, its resilience and action plan too. Do come over. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I am uh, Durgeshpal, Director General, Uttarakhand Science and Technology Council, UCOST Dehradun. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action, and science and technology centric disaster management systems. In Uttarakhand Dev Bhumi, we are organizing the sixth World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th of November to 1st of December. This sixth World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those are working in different domains of disaster management. So they will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where everybody will deliberate, where every one will come together and put forward a comprehensive viewpoint with regard to disaster management, its resilience and action plan too. Do come over. Thank you so much. Namaskar. I am uh, Durgeshpal, Director General, Uttarakhand Science and Technology Council, UCOST Dehradun. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action, and science and technology centric disaster management systems. In Uttarakhand Dev Bhumi, we are organizing the sixth World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th of November to 1st of December. This sixth World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those are working in different domains of disaster management. So they will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where everybody will deliberate, where every 
one will come together and put forward a comprehensive viewpoint with regard to disaster management, its resilience and action plan too. Do come over. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's 6.5. I am uh, Durgesh Pan, Director General, Uttarakhand, Science and Technology Council, UCOST, Gerardo. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action, and science and technology centric disaster management systems. In Uttarakhand, Deo, we are organizing the sixth. World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th of November to 1st of December. This sixth World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those who are working in different domains of disaster management. So they will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where everybody will deliberate where every one will come together and put forward a comprehensive viewpoint with regard to disaster management, its resilience and action plan too. Do come over. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. She is an urban planner. Oh, nice. I am uh, Durgesh Pan, Director General, Uttarakhand, Science and Technology Council, UCOST, Dehradun. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action, and science and technology centric disaster management systems. In Uttarakhand, Deo, we are organizing the sixth World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th of November to 1st of December. This sixth World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those who are working in different domains of disaster management. So they will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where everybody will deliver it, where every one will come together and put forward a comprehensive viewpoint with regard to disaster management, resilience and action plan. Do come over. Thank you so much. But I think our teachers very... I am uh, Durgesh Pan, Director General, Uttarakhand, Science and Technology Council, Deepost Gaiagun. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action, and science and technology centric disaster management systems. In Uttarakhand, Deo, we are organizing the sixth World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th of November to 1st of December. This sixth World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those who are working in different domains of disaster management, so they will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where everybody will deliberate, where every one will come together and put forward a comprehensive viewpoint with regard to disaster management, its resilience and action plan too. Do come over. Thank you so much. I am uh, Durgesh Pan, Director General, Uttarakhand, Science and Technology Council, UCOST, Dehradun. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action, and science and technology centric disaster management systems. In Uttarakhand, Deo Bhumi, we are organizing the sixth World Congress on Disaster Management on the 28th of November to 1st of December. This sixth World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those who are working in different domains of disaster management. So they will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where everybody will deliberate, where every one will come together 
and put forward a comprehensive viewpoint with regard to disaster management, its resilience and action plan too. Do come over. Thank you so much. Thank you. I am uh, Durgesh Pal, Director General, Uttarakhand Science and Technology Council, UCOST Dehradun. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action, and science and technology centric disaster management systems. In Uttarakhand Deobhumi, we are organizing the sixth. World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th of November to 1st of December. This sixth World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those who are working in different domains of disaster management. So we will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where everybody will deliberate where every one will come together and put forward a comprehensive viewpoint with regard to disaster management, its resilience and action plan too. Do come over. Thank you so much. Namaskar. So, Mr. Ms. Paul Gathering, can we request you to come here? I am uh, Durgesh Pal, Director General, Uttarakhand Science and Technology Council, UCOST Dehradun. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action, and science and technology centric disaster management systems. In Uttarakhand Deobhumi, we are organizing the sixth World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th of November to 1st of December. This sixth World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those who are working in different domains of disaster management. So they will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where every... Okay, thank you friends for joining us this evening. Um, it's the last session of the day and that also is running over an hour. Maybe we will the advantage of uh, such a session is that you are left with only those people who are truly interested and, and want to learn and share and talk about uh, what, what's happening. So we won't even keep you for the entire, um, you know, let's, let's keep it a shorter or a more focused conversation uh, with those of us who are here. Uh, we are talking about, uh, in this session we are talking about climate, um, climate information and services that deliver this climate information. Uh, I'll take no more than 10 minutes to share a little bit about uh, some work we are doing uh, in the Himalayan states, including the government. But I think at the core of it, there are, uh, based on the work we've been doing and what we've been seeing in this region, uh, there is a very stark trend in the last 10 years of unprecedented climate induced disasters every year. So, and every year we say this is an unprecedented event, it's never happened. 2013, we had the, what we call the Kedarna flood. It was a block uh, killed over 5,000 people in this state uh, upstream. Uh, and this year, we have had a similar incident in uh, Sikkim, uh, where Mr. Sharma is the chair of the State Disaster Management Authority. It was a block uh, event that took away a uh, hydropower dam and then wiped out all the settlements downstream that were along the river. And in between, we have had a number of cloudburst events, hailstorm events. Uh, flash flood, urban floods. This whole trend has been a far stronger in the last 10 15 years than ever before. But the first urban flood we saw in uh, Mumbai in uh, 2004 was a shocker, but since then we have had similar events in Srinagar, in Bhopal, in Chennai, in Kochi. So the, the, it, this is beating on past trends. And it's not just cities, we are seeing the impact of this uh, in the rural areas. We are seeing this uh, very strongly in the uh, agrarian um, society and communities that we uh, are surrounded with. There's a, there's a very well-known, notorious uh, story of the last apple tree in Himachal Pradesh, a farm here where it was earlier known for its apple orchards, which are now
colleague Srishti here leads that uh, program. And, and of the many problems that we see, uh, we thought today we can briefly talk about the top three. Uh, I'll lay them out and then I'll very quickly show you how we've arrived at these and then we can have an open discussion. So the first problem that we find is that uh, the warnings, the weather warnings that come to us are coming based on weather stations and data which is from a very far away place. So Dehradun data is used to generate warnings for this entire region. And over the last few years, the number of weather stations has grown. But still we have about, probably in this state, an average of about one weather station for about 130 odd villages. Right. And, and the, the truth on the ground is that even in one village panchayat, it might, they're so sparsely uh, populated that it might be heavily raining on one slope while the other part which is across the ridge might be bright and sunny. So while we colloquially talk, talk about this in cities, you know, it's raining in my neighborhood but it's not raining in yours, but in these communities it is having uh, pretty devastating impacts. So how do we improve our understanding when the weather data is so sparse, is something on which some work is happening and a lot more needs to be done. Uh, and the doing of that work, the direction it is taking now is the Indian Meteorological Department is also opening doors for voluntary uh, data gathering, mm. crowdsourcing of weather data. Schools are installing weather stations. We work with a number of schools to do that. Uh, farming groups are now getting, you know, reading. So what was earlier a high-end meteorological science is becoming a people science and we need to push that a lot more. The second problem that we need to solve is that the format in which the warning comes is very difficult to decipher and understand. So typically we would say uh, chances of extreme rainfall over the next 48 hours. And if you go into detail, it will say 200 millimeters of rainfall. Now what does 200 millimeters of rainfall mean for me or for my village or for my house or my farm is very difficult even for any of us to understand while we work in this sector. So we can imagine how difficult it is for uh, community groups to understand. We often get flood warnings that there has been a release of 200 cusecs of water, 200,000 cusecs of water from a dam upstream. So a, a cusec is a cubic foot per second and a cubic foot is about 28 liters. That multiplied by 200,000. If it is being released today from a dam 70 kilometers upstream, what does it mean for me? It's very difficult for people to decipher. So how, how to convert these warnings, which we see as hazard warnings, they're about an event, into impact warnings, which is what this will mean to you, what it's going to do to you. Very little work has happened on this, and that's something we really need to unravel and unlock. And the third part which relates uh, to climate change is that these unprecedented events are becoming very frequent. And we don't know where this is heading. So uh, while we Every year we say that the monsoon eventually was normal or in the normal range, but in, the, in, in between, the Met Department also says the rainfall is delayed, but it will rain in the coming weeks and the monsoon will become normal. A monsoon once delayed can never become normal because the farmer, when he needed the rain for his crops, did not get it. So if it rains later and if it rains a lot later, your average is normal, but the distribution hides the entire tragedy of a climate that is changing in a very unpredictable and a very variable way. So with these three problems, uh, we entered this. Uh, it's a piece of, uh, it's, it's a very small piece of work. Uh, Sishti, who will be changing it there? Uh, yes. I'm running this for Akhilesh and yes. Professor Davis and myself. So I'll not be going into details. Uh, these are the challenges that I just spoke about. and. Uh, uh, and how we want to resolve it. Very quickly, I'll talk about how, um, okay, I'm, I'm moving to the slide which says phase one. Uh, and so there, there's three rounds of work that we are trying to do. Num oh, can you, can these lights be turned off? Can you turn off these lights, if possible? Yeah. So these ones. Yeah. 
So, so this is what Sishti and our colleagues and, and all of us have been doing for the last uh, year and a half, going around these communities and looking at uh, how people perceive, uh, you know, these changes. And very often uh, there's been past work also on this while we are trying to look at how uh, the data is showing us that things have moved. Uh, I move to the next slide on key milestones. Uh, we are seeing how people perceive this, you know, and it's a very interesting trend. We've been seeing this in past studies also, that when the farming community is saying that rainfall has decreased, actual data is telling us that the rainfall has marginally increased. We are seeing an increasing trend across the board, but people are perceiving it lower because when they need the rainfall, they don't get it. So uh, in the first round of work, what we did was across these states, we went around, we interacted with people, sat with them, tried to understand what they are, what they are perceiving their problems to be and how the data is responding to that. And also where, where we find gaps that will need to be filled through communicating with these people. When we try to convert this into uh, hazard vulnerability and risk analysis, this is where we try to overlay. So we are overlaying participatory information with the critical information that is coming from the data and we see, we see a gap over there, right? That's what dri is driving us to understand uh, that if from these early warnings we need to move to better understanding uh, and better resolutions, how will people receive it in the end? Uh, and what formats of communicating, what was always called the last mile, uh, some of our colleagues now call it the first mile, because if you see it from the end of the people, that's for them, that's the first, pe first mile where impact is happening and where they need to see this information come. So uh, that's, that's the first round of work we did. And on this basis, then we focused a bit more on farming communities and school communities to understand relevance of warnings how understandable these warnings are, how actionable they are. So just getting the warning is not good enough. How do you translate that into impact, into actions to be taken and how timely all of this is when it happens. After this understanding, you see uh, an image over here where we, where we actually have installed a number of weather stations to see how community weather stations and uh, this is also a state where community radio stations um, are quite active how taking this science to the people can help uh, you know re better and more timely and more accurate reactions so this has been happening in the last uh, few months and then from there we are trying to derive what exactly is that people would want to know who are the intermediaries who can make this happen including the frontline workers of the government uh, field volunteers and for them to do it, uh, if you want to go to the target audience that will actually benefit, who like the local youth, for an example, is a group we are working with, H how and what actions they can play <coughs> in this. So this is, uh, this is the way we look at how to move from very, uh, very, you know, scientific warnings to something that is an ongoing uh, sustainability action uh, in these communities. To do this, we do a series of stakeholder analysis. Uh, we engage with people. As I said, we try to find out how things are perceived. So perception and behavior uh, is a piece uh, that is of importance. And from there, we traverse down to how to validate this information. And since we spoke about perception, then it also becomes important. What will make people change their behavior to be doing things in a certain way that will help them better? right? And one of the more recent things that we've, we've tried to tinker with is, uh, we are right now calling it a nudge. What kind of nudges will make people do certain things which, will, which are based more on you know, how to respond to these warnings? Um, and you, you, uh, you had helped us with one of our first studies on urban risk reduction, uh, Delhi and Ahmedabad. And one of the colleagues that came from, who came from OCDS, Kevin had done a, a very interesting piece of work with us called the theory of reasoned action, uh, which is a theory from the media world to apply here. And the theory of reasoned action says that for any action that you take, the reasoning has multiple tracks of which knowledge is only one small part. But we in the government and the, and the aid world assume that if we give knowledge 
people will understand and they will act in a certain way. And it doesn't happen. We tell people don't use plastic bags because they're bad for the environment. We say wear a helmet, we say wear a seat belt. It doesn't happen because knowledge itself does not make people behave in a certain way. There, there are attitudinal issues, there are social references, there are environmental constraints which stop people from doing certain things. So we are going back to that level that the science can solve it to a certain level, but how to get people to perceive things in a certain way, how attitudes need to be addressed so that practice and behavior can lead to more resilient lifestyles in these communities. Uh, uh, where we are now is a, is a, is a piece where we are looking at uh, uh, how to bring this how to bring this as an entire package, not as a, just as a training module. We see constraints in training modules for changing behaviors. And we are grappling with that right now. So this is an ongoing piece of work. As I said, it's happening in this state and in Sikkim. We would invite thoughts, we would invite a conversation uh, in whatever few minutes we have today. But also beyond today to invite you to please come and engage with us if you have any thoughts, if you would like us to try anything, if you would like to try anything with us in the field areas. We are working in Uttarkashi, which is not too far from here. That is a district that we are working in, in um, Uttarakhand. And we are working in two districts in Sikkim. Very happy to have you join us there. But this is the conversation for us today. That is a training module and a, tra a set of training programs good enough to change behavior in this world where we are seeing problems of warnings, their precision, their the people's ability to understand warnings and the variability in the climate that we are facing. So I'll pause here and let's open this up. It's a small cozy group. Let's have a nice conversation for the next 15, 20 minutes if we can. Maybe, maybe I could just start by saying well, one thing about information is interesting. We, we did a study of shelter for the UN and when we presented it, one of the people who was reviewing this study, the first UN study of shelter following disasters, he said, I think it's quite a useful document, but it's not particularly usable. Useful and usable. And I, I, I often thought about that, that how, how to make knowledge which is absolutely usable. Um, and then we had a, an interesting experience in India where there was an earthquake in, in Latour in 1993 in a place called Kilari. It's halfway between Mumbai and Hyderabad. And uh, it's a very unusual place for an earthquake to happen. So there'd been very little modification of buildings beforehand to try and resist earthquakes. In fact, there hadn't been any, and that's why so many buildings perhaps failed. And uh, the, the Indian government handled it quite well, and the agency I was connected with uh, built a town, a small town, called Malkonji. And um, it was very nicely designed by a Delhi-based firm of architects called Development Alternatives. Development Alternatives, yes. Based on ideas from an Indian architect called, an English architect, Laurie Baker, who was married to an Indian lady, and he lived in Kerala for his lifetime, really. I think he was a Scottish architect, originally. And um, it was a very interesting design using little clusters as compared to ribbon development along streets because people had cattle and they used to bring the cattle into the courtyard around their cluster at night to stop people stealing their animals. So he allowed this factor to influence it all. We did an evaluation of this housing in 1996. And when you do an evaluation, you accumulate a huge amount of data we had public health people, we had um, nutritionists, we had planners, engineers, and two architects, and also the team that built it in the team, big team. And we were very positive about this thing, but there were many issues that divided us in our team. And one of them was toilets, because each house had a toilet in it, a long drop toilet, like a pit latrine and none of them were being used, none. In fact, in, in where the toilets were, people were putting sacks of grain and agricultural instruments, because they're mainly farming people. Um, 
So we have a big debate in our evaluation team about this situation. The people from the health background said, you have to provide toilets, but you shouldn't provide education with it. And it could take 25 years for these to be used. But there's no point in building houses in modern India without toilets. Other people said, no, no, they go out in the fields, that's their tradition, and you're not going to change it by putting it in buildings. Behavioural change is a very, very slow process. Lots of debate about this whole issue. I was, I was co-leading the, the evaluation team with someone called Mihir Bhatt, who runs an organisation in Ahmedabad called Disaster Mitigation, All India Disaster Mitigation Institute. And me here. Could you shut the door? Uh, sorry, it's a bit long, long-winded. I'm coming to the point in a moment as to what what I would. Me here said, why don't we go back and visit this place 15 years later and see what happened? A team that did it, uh, and we um, we went back. And one of the issues was the toilets. What had happened? We met the village leader, and the village leader said, uh, the village leader said, all the toilets are in use in every house. And uh, this has been a big social change. And the, the interesting thing was, how did that happen? How, do, how did it I said, So we said, how quickly did this take place? He said it took place overnight. It took place in, in one weekend. He we said, look, this is crazy. How, how, there must be something, there's no, been no education to speak of. So how, how come toilets which were used to store grain suddenly became toilets in use quickly? And the answer was a school teacher. One school teacher, the headmistress of the new school. The new school was built with World Bank money, and the local children came. There were about 150 children in the school. And the headmistress said to the children, the first day at school, you're all in your new uniforms. This is a modern school in modern India. It's a great privilege for you to be at school. Now, modern children use toilets, and we're going to show you how to use toilets, and you must go back to your house clear away all these sacks of seeds and stuff, tell your parents they must use the toilets, and your aunts and uncles, and your sisters, and your grandparents, whoever's living in your house. Every child in this school will use the toilets. We won't be going in the fields anymore. This isn't how we're going to do it. And the reason for this is because then she explained to the children, because we interviewed her, she said, I told them it was about hygiene. And as the population was growing in these parts of India, you could not have these old traditions, which might have worked in their grandparents' days, but they didn't work now. And what struck me as so interesting in this situation is how conventional wisdom was that you wouldn't get that kind of behavioral change without a great deal of public education over a long period of time, but in mm. met data. So it's very crucial that they get it right. And they've been very conservative in the past on giving data. And so I, I mean, I'm just I'm very excited with what you're saying, is that you can't just produce raw data. You've got to actually have research on how to present it. And you've got to use the right method of doing it. And, and maybe, maybe you, you need to help people to understand the levels of uncertainty, because there are many uncertainties in this. For example, if, if there's been heavy rainfall before the flooding, the ground won't absorb it, it's saturated, and so you, you're going to get a much faster runoff, and you get all sorts of factors which might not be fed into the calculations and so on. So warnings is one of those really problematic areas which requires a lot of public education, and it requires change agents, I think, in schools, religious leaders, local officials, to interpret it and explain the variables and say this might happen, this might not happen. But let's be on the safe side. Let's, let's recognise it's not going to hurt us anything to start evacuating upstairs in the house or putting in bags, sandbags, or doing something about this flooding, blocking it from coming in, or, or taking all our furniture upstairs. In the long term, do something else. 
change your electricity so that the cables are one metre above ground and so they're not at the ground level where they're going to get wrecked and big changes like that. So I think, I think with warning systems you need a big social infrastructure on the ground of people who are connected to it, who can interpret it and explain it. They might not, they're, they're, not, they're not meteorologists, but they're people the village can trust. And you need these intermediaries around, and midwives are very good at this, teachers are very good at that, religious leaders are good at that, and local officials. But anyway, enough of me. Do you want to add anything about the problem of data and warnings? From your experience, I can... Oh. Well, I live in Darwin, which is the top end of Australia, and uh, it is a region very prone to cyclones. In 1974, there was a cyclone known as Cyclone Tracy, which has pretty much uh, knocked off all the buildings, pretty much all the buildings, uh, bearing very few. So, uh, and as Anshu has explained uh, in the beginning of his talk, that we do receive warnings about the cyclones or other hazards, but also the routine climate related information in a language which a common person doesn't understand. And this still happens in Australia. Uh, in, 19, uh, in 2017 when I started living, I started living in, in Darwin in 2015. In 2017 there was a cyclone warning was released. I was preparing a preparatory kit for home and uh, somebody was uh, mocking at me. He said, you are preparing to prepare the kit. We will do a, a party in the eye of a cyclone. I said, eye of a cyclone and party? They said, yes, don't believe these warnings. They are never true. And that is the real example I'm giving you. And plus also, now the Bureau of Metrology uh, in, in Australia, they have appointed, they started appointing community workers and social scientists because they realized that the warnings they release are not penetrating uh, in the masses, especially the geography where I live. About about one third of the population consists of indigenous and Aboriginal people, and they speak various languages. And it's <coughs> even more difficult to uh, you know take the messages to them. So it's not just about the translating the information; it's also about making the information usable. So useful and usable. That's what you just highlighted. So even if I have the information which is in my language, but how do I interpret it? And can I use it? Can I make decisions based on this? And this is a very, uh, uh, I must say, very interesting topic, a very difficult topic as well. And we do not have necessarily very easy answers to this. And I really wanted to highlight this method because whether it is Australia or probably UK or India, these issues of how people interpret the messages given by the organizations which are largely dominated by the scientists and they really are very well intended organizations but what will influence uh, a <coughs> common person to take action to safeguard their livelihoods house assets etc is going to be a difficult challenge and uh, uh, although i'm not offering any solution but just sharing some of the hints from yeah. Go, just going back, one thing I meant to mention about these famous toilets was that I asked the headmistress, how did you argue with the children about this? She said, she said, I didn't bother with the public health issue. I just wanted to appeal to their pride in being school children. They'd always looked forward to being in school. They'd been in small schools before. Now they were proper in a proper big school. I wanted to appeal to them as being modern children. And this is how, that was her technique. And, and she, she went for a sort of, and they obviously had great pride, these children, in this new school. And it was a new beginning for them and for their families, who saved up a lot of money to buy them their uniforms and everything. And um, so I think that the way we present information is, how do we present it in ways that people want to receive it, or are sympathetic to it, or can act on it closely? Um, I, don't, I don't think you, for example, say there's a 50% chance that you might be flooded. A better way would be to say there is a possibility that you'll be flooded and we think it will be between these days and this day. Our advice to you is as follows. You must leave the area with your pets by this date because there is a serious risk to life in this area. But here we don't think there's such a serious risk. 
so you could stay but move upstairs. So you've got to put it in much more specific language, yes. I think, which people can understand and, and relate to their own values, relate to their own... Is that, the, is that what you found? I, I think in a very <clears throat> in a very powerful way, yes, and you you articulated it really well. And it's the usability. We were not using that term, and, and I think this is this is a very clever way to say it: useful versus usable. Uh, we've been looking at how people are able to understand and turn that into actions. And unfortunately, none of the advice right now includes the action part of it. We don't say move or not move. In extreme situations, of legal reasons. in cyclones, we do. Because worried, the governments are worried about. I think we've not even broken it down to that level. You know, we've we've we haven't reached that point where. I think in our in our own mindsets, we've we've always assumed that if we give a weather warning, people will act. Yeah. It's only extreme evacuations where we need to go and physically help them evacuate in cyclones that we do that. Right. Otherwise, we just assume that they will, and when we go to their side and we see that, that they don't. Yeah. Uh, and and this piece is missing, you know, this graded response that you are at extreme risk, you are at high risk, you are at low risk. Yes. This is what you can do is completely missing from our uh, way of works. Yeah. Sure. There's a, a, any thoughts uh, anyone would like to add? I want to add one thing, sir. Uh, basically, with respect to the hunt, when you will stay in Dehradun. <coughs> And you will go to Mussoorie, of course. Everybody knows that at that time the rainfall will occur or hailing will occur. But when you are working in Uttar Kashi, is there any system who will inform them at that time the hailing will start or rainfall will start? So, my submission is that we have to improve this type of system or we have to design a system. Everybody should understand they are very local people and uh, they don't know how the hailing will be done, what is the hazard of this thing. Uh, take the example of Silkiara tunnel. People enter in the tunnel and they think uh, on Dipavali we will celebrate the Dipavali and they will not come out from the tunnel. So uh, I am not blaming anybody. This is a effect of uh, nature. The, the tunnel will uh, parts will come out, but uh, we should design the aspect of we should design a system where before entering in these type of activities, people know at that time you will come out, otherwise you will be plucked inside this tunnel or inside the river. There is a very uh, low. Uh, care on this, poor care on this. Very valid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. You want to. Hello. So, I am Shreya Madhavan from the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. And while you are working on a very, the last mile or first mile connectivity level of early warning systems, we were working on the very opposite end. Like, if early warning systems in India are available or accessible to the population itself or not. And we were focusing on floods and cyclone early warning systems in India, and we were clearly able to see a disparity. Like one, where India is leading in terms of cyclone early warning systems because they have been able to make it available to everyone. That's the first part of it. Right. Like you have very clearly mentioned, in Dehradun it will rain. It will rain in very different regions, but you will just get a warning based on Dehradun's meteorological forecast, which will not be accurate for the entire district of Dehradun, let's say. So this is where the like the factor of making flood early warning systems very regional and local um, plays a very big role. And what we were able to identify was that if our research says that 66% of population is in India is exposed to floods, whereas only 33% of that exposed population has an availability of early warning system. So we're not able, uh, like not even able to go to the next level, like can you access information, but like you don't even have an availability of an early yes. warning system for you. And why we wanted to look at this parity was we wanted to assess the effectiveness of early warning systems in the basis of available, accessible and effective. So once we are saying it's not available, but is there an infrastructure already existing? 
So now we know that the best way uh, to transmit early warnings is like you can, you can do mass information dissemination and you can do targeted. So mass is radios, community radios, television systems, whereas targeted ones are your mobile phones. And we feel now to penetrate your last mile or first mile connectivity, everyone has an access to a smartphone or a telephone at least. And we were able to find that our 8 out of 10 people in these exposed areas had at least one family member had a telephone or a mobile system with them. So in, if the government will just act on the first step of installing these early warning systems at a regional level and making these um, warnings localized or impact based as you were correctly calling it, will actually, the next phase is already set up. So you already have that much population that already can access that information. <coughs> you just don't have the availability of the system itself. That's the first step that you have to reach. Um, however, um, through our research, we also found that you might also know that Government of India has recently launched the CAP protocol, Common Alerting Protocol, um, in which they are including these impact-based messages, where if you are in a flood-prone area, you will get a message that XX region, so like Yamuna floodplain is going to be flooded, everyone in Delhi got it. And on XYZ day, you are going to get this much rainfall. So stay away from these areas, move to higher zones, yeah. or take an umbrella. So these warnings were issued, but it's still in the piloting phase. So this is happening, but then early warnings are also very state-based. True, Subject Absolutely. in India, so some states are leading in this, whereas some Absolutely. states still have to catch. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you for that. So, so Yen, we have two, two parts to the so the one oh yes, yes. Please, please, please. please. No, so mine just is much more from an experience from the United States about um, work that I had done where the state of Texas, which is which gets hurricanes all the time, it used to give out uh, quarter million maps to people saying that if you're in category one risk area, then you need to move category two and so on. But those maps were A4 size, and they would give these out assuming people would evacuate. And they would just tell on the news that you are in category three area, please evacuate. But people didn't know how to read those maps. And then in Florida, they used to do it by zip code. They would say zip code so and so, so and so numbers, all of you all evacuate. And that made sense because we ask people to read maps, women read maps differently from men. And those small maps don't have a reference point. They don't have uh, landmarks. So our research showed that uh, to make it more accessible to the common man, just telling them these kinds of things, those maps are not roads, actual roads on the ground. So better to have it where they can identify by highways or they can identify by, as you're saying, where they should go and what actions they should do. And so years later, after Hurricane Katrina, actually the maps were changed to zip code based maps, um, which are now being used in Texas as well. Mm. So even in a country like the United States, with so much of money, they made such a big mistake, and then they found out that to reach the people, they, and it also, one of the things they do is, those maps on the back side of it, it says, from the kitchen, what item should you take? From the bedroom, what item should you take? So it gives a list of things, and you stick it on your, like on your refrigerator, you can have either side, so you can get a copy. The front side will say this is where your house is, and the back side will say what you should take from each room of your house. I right. thought that was a very cool idea. Yeah, great. Sure. No, th th that's really useful. Uh, what what I'm seeing is again two parts to the problem. One is that, and uh, you know, people receiving the warning. Uh, I was also alarmed to get to know last week. The World Meteorological Organization says that about 50% of the people globally still do not get early warnings. And that's a very large number. Uh, at the same time, of course. Um, early warnings for disasters. Yeah. Right? At the same time, that's an alarming problem, but the path pathway is clear. You need to do X, Y, Z. If half the people are getting warnings, the other half also need to get those warnings. The part that we probably are beginning to grapple with is uh, something our friend Rajiv has been speaking about. Um, he was here in the morning session. He had then to leave. Uh, Rajiv Shaw from now from Keio University did research uh, in the East Japan earthquake impacted areas, uh, earthquake and tsunami areas, Sendai coast. Uh, yeah, and I remember Rajiv very frustratedly saying that after so many years of work in Japan, 
which is known for drilling the message into right, you know, people right from elementary school. Um, Akhilesh has been and worked there and has had his family there. He knows this. And still, when the tsunami warning came, a very large number of people did not evacuate. They had 11 to 15 minutes on the Sendai coast. People did not evacuate. Why they didn't evacuate, right? So even if you get the warning to the entire 100% population, there's a large chunk of educated, trained, sensitive people who have the knowledge, who don't respond, and then what do you do? Uh, did you have your hand up, sir? Yeah, yeah. yeah please. Thank you very much. I'm the PhD sir. I'm from Abu Dhabi. So regarding the climate uh, information studies, it's really uh, have many dimensions. Firstly, the hazard information. The three types of the hazards we're talking about. Say, drought warning, one type, cyclone, hurricane warning, other types, and the thunderstorm is another type. So, and the, that depends on the community and geographic locations. So, regarding the climate environment, we have to think about this. It's not a uniform world we live in. Very diverse uh, locations and the diverse community, knowledge, ability, disability of the people. So, putting this in the context, I give one example from the Bangladesh coast. Um, regarding the cyclone, uh, in like most people don't know about the hurricane, hurricane in the Bangladesh coast. Uh, if we say, people hear the warning signal, say for example, minimum five to seven times uh, in India. Think in a context, people living in a rural area, they have the lots of um, in the post the coastal of the regions where I'm talking about mostly poor people live there within the last uh, within the three kilometer or four kilometer zones. Because hurricane is most impact the three to four kilometers of the coastal zone. So people have the crops in the field, people have the livestock to take care and people most cases does not have the proper road network there some cases. So practically this is if you give a warning, uh, understanding warning, going message, I would say uh, living in the zone, people understand this. But the fact is that the warnings are missed, they understand this, and cognitions and the evacuation. What do you give the information for evacuation? When it comes to the evacuation point, it's very complex decision, as I say. Because uh, <coughs> living in a, that area, people, the livelihood concern and the economy uh, don't have the savings enough, they have to work every day in the field, or fishermen have to go to the fishing in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, evacuation is not, decision is not that much, that much easy for them. Because if, how many times, as I said, even six, seven times, they get that much information. Five, uh, five level one, I mean the warning signal seven is the one people usually evacuate. So four, two, five, six type of signal, they get it many times a year. So now think about the evacuation involves the cost. It's not only the, their livelihood they have to leave, uh, that is not unattended. Even their livestock, two things there. One is the agriculture from the farms, Second, from the livestock uh, incomes. They have to leave behind that one and also involve the evacuation from the transport cost and other facilities they need to take for the days to sustain them. Yeah. So, that point of view also has to consider. So, nowadays, we, we, that's why we're saying about the insurance policy to be implemented uh, in the rural communities uh, for such losses. Second thing also to give the expenses to evacuate. Because giving the information, people don't understand. Rural people, uh, you say they, are, they, they less understand, I don't believe that. As you see in the plenary, they are the powerful, they have the knowledge, they have everything. But when it comes to the practicality of the decision making and evacuating, making some loss behind, and I have to go for living, uh, in, a, in a years, uh, years living in a, uh, in a, in a region, every, every year, five, seven times, you leave them to your houses, to go to the shelter center for a cycle. It's a very complex scenario. Thank you. Yeah, okay. very true. So uh, that is the one practical as well. I mean, so I, I have a question now to you regarding the cyclone hazard information to the impact uh, information. Did you make any policy changes through you uh, or is it a very preliminary or primary stage of the research? Did you have any impact of this system? Did you implement or give the message to any government? Company? That's exactly where we are uh, and why this is timely. It's very preliminary. We have not done it. This is what we are trying to design now. And I think as we will now have to start moving towards winding up this uh, session in the next 10 odd minutes. But this is where we can talk about any suggestions any of you may have, uh, any, any possibilities of collaborating as we go ahead. And I speak on behalf of our UNDP colleagues who couldn't make it here today. Over the next six months, we are going to take this to, to the ground and we are going to be running this. 
and we would open this invitation for collaborating, for coming, joining us, uh, advising us on what things we can do. It's, it's not exactly a research piece, but it's partly experimental. We are willing to try things and fail at those as long as we learn something meaningful. Uh, we do know that there's a very fuzzy zone of behavioral uh, science that we are entering, which we don't completely understand. Uh, and and when, when you were sharing about the US maps, ma'am, I was also reminded very quickly, I'll share. You know, when we were trying to figure out how to get the message across, uh, Ian, you gave this great example of the school. I came across one study, uh, a, re a piece of research that was done by a power grid company in Canada. And they were trying to see how to get people, how to get families to reduce their power consumption, you know, switch off unnecessary uh, appliances and lights. So they took uh, a, a district and they divided it into three, randomly three kinds of uh, families, cohorts. <coughs> to one set of people along with their bill, they sent a message that by saving electricity, you will help save the earth. It's environmentally useful and meaningful. To the second set, uh, one third of people, they gave a message with the monthly bill that if you save electricity, you can save this much money, which is money saved is money earned. So it makes financial sense. To a third set, one third of the people, they gave the message that others are doing this. You know, other people are saving money and contributing. Blah, blah. And then they tracked the change in the next two or three months in the bills. And the maximum dent took place in the group that was told that others are doing this. Right? So the logic, the science, we assume if you give the money logic, it will work. Actually, it doesn't. People, I, I've just come from Delhi. We have come from Delhi today, from the smoggy Delhi. All kinds of logic, all kinds of science on pollution, on diesel vehicles doesn't work. Uh, but this Canadian study finds that if others are doing it, then people want to do that. So it's a very, it's a very interesting world of how the human mind works. And I think that's where we are heading. So once again, we'll open it up and Ian and Akhil. Yeah. Well, one, one lesson from this is multidisciplinary work and interdisciplinary work. It means that meteorologists will not crack this problem by themselves. They, they, need, they need psychologists, they need behavioral people, and they need common men and women. They, they need the assistance of other groups. And, and that maybe being an architect is, it was a useful professional background for me because I began to realize that you just had to work with other people. And I'd go to a meeting and the architect might be the leader at a certain point in the meeting but then he ceases to be the meeting or she does and the engineer is taking over because you're discussing a structural problem and then it might change and you're talking about sound and the acoustic consultant is taking over and it's a collaborative listening and learning and the center of gravity is continually moving so the, 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 the meteorologist's expertise runs out at a certain point. He doesn't know about this subtlety of human behavior. Other people have spent their lives looking at that. So I suppose one problem is that we're back in this discussion we had earlier about silos. That if we've got a world made up of silos of this is this profession, this is this, but this one is making all the decisions, probably going to go wrong. And so it's connectivity again, I think, aren't you? And, and the need for us to, to start recognizing the limitations of our position. Everybody's got limitations in where, they, where they're standing. I, I've got, there, are, there are grave limitations in that. And just a, an example of that cropped up, and I was talking to Akalish about it. We ran a course once for policemen, and we were talking about emergency management. And I asked the policemen, from all over the world to write down on a flip chart what the, what the attitudes were needed by police working in emergency management. And they did a whole lot of stuff got written down about responsible uh, was one of them kept on reoccurring, another one was obedience, another one was um, uh, accuracy and so on and so forth. And I looked at the list and said, I think there's one subject which I think is missing. And they all looked at me and I said, what? And I said, you, you've missed out the word creativity. Mm. And one of the, the senior policemen, who I think who came from, I think he was British, he said, that's the last thing I want. 
if I'm running a, an emergency operation, I don't want any creativity at all. I want people to, I don't want any improvisation, I want, I want SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures, and I want everybody to follow them to the, to the letter, and if they don't, we're going to be in deep trouble. And the, the group were kind of nodding in agreement with what he was saying. And then there was an African at the back of the room, I can, remember, I can just remember where he was sitting, saying, I, I, I d entirely disagree. He said, because you, you come from a country where there's lots of resources. I come from a country where we have very limited resources. And, and the, art, the art of what we do is how to make a lot out of a little. And to make a lot out of a little, you need to be highly creative. So he said, in any team I have, I want somebody creative who's going to be, think, think differently and think a different way. And he said, they're invaluable. He said, they might irritate the other people, but that isn't the point. They're, they're a necessary part of the equation. So that was an example of, of, of people recognizing the limitation uh, of a team. If, if you've got very organized military style leadership, you do need cre this creativity. Then I talked to an army man, I said, majors and captains seem to be very obedient. He says, yes, but if you go up the line, they have to get very creative. Brigadiers and above that, they're highly creative people. All the best generals are creative people because they have to be creative. He said, lower down, obedience, responsibility, but up at the top, you've got to have that kind of... So that was another example of, I just think of, of interdependence. And maybe one answer to what Artu is talking about is, is the need for us to recognize that we need to work with other people much more closely and build structures which require us to work with other people. Don't you think that happened? You come across this too. Indeed, it is, it is an important observation. And, uh, and thank you, Anishu, for also bringing the example of uh, Japan. And uh, actually, people on the coast of Tohoku got a minimum of half an hour to maximum two hour warning. And despite of that, the fact that we consider them as a well-aware community and uh, uh, the information did reach to the last mile, they failed to take action. And one of the uh, hurdle was that they said that this kind of warning has been issued the uh, last couple of years. And, but nothing has happened. My town was safe. It was only 30 centimeter tsunami. It was only, you know, it was just a little splash of water on the coastal road and things like that. And after that, they also built some, you know, <coughs> uh, some, some, you know, buffer zones or some other, you know, uh, structures are created. And I thought it was very safe. And uh, uh, it takes a generation to teach something, it looks like. And when it comes to things like tsunami, it can take several generations. So if something has happened more than 40 years ago, people forget. I'm giving you an example of Cyclone Tracy in Darwin, 1974 close to 50 years, today not a single soul is bothered about the cyclones. They think, um, oh, that's easy, we can manage it. We did it well previously. So uh, uh, so the, the false sense of safety, which is built into people, because it could be because of the better cyclone ports, it could be because of the tsunami resistant structures, etc. Uh, how we can you know break these myths that fail safe structures doesn't exist and the warning has to be taken seriously. And uh, that requires a whole a lot of study about the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary attitudes, behavior, yeah, sure. culture, perception, and sure, all sure. yeah. and, and some And some of those groups mistrust <coughs> other groups. I mean, some of the scientific people we worked with are very suspicious of social data, highly suspicious of social workers and social data. And maybe vice versa as well, perhaps. I don't know. And, and so, so sometimes it's prejudice you're dealing with. Do you, you've encountered prejudice? Yes. That sort of thing? Yes, absolutely. How, how do you crack it? I don't know yet. <laughs> it's a very difficult one. It's a very, very difficult one. Yeah. Maybe by universities getting together and, and forming working groups made of different departments and different students from yeah. different groups. So they're beginning to practice this kind of um, inter, interdisciplinary behavior and getting respect for other people's. We've been talking about this, Ian, but 
I will, I, I, and I have, I have much lesser experience than you, but I've only seen the silos get more harder yeah. Uh, yeah. often. I, they're getting concrete. They're getting concrete, con- concretized, so. yeah. All mixed up and set permanently. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Any suggestions from anyone as to exactly. how you break down these barriers between disciplines? So, so we must close in the next okay. 10 odd minutes. No, but we'll do this, exactly this. Let's open this up on any suggestions, any thoughts anyone has uh, very quickly. Then I will request Srishti to share uh, in a minute about where we are going with this work in the next uh, six odd months and an invitation again to you to to communicate beyond today's session. And finally, I'll have one closing question that I've been sitting with for Professor Ian Davis and we'll end with that. So let's open the floor. Any quick thoughts, any comments? Thank you so you much. We, we are going to certainly take up uh, on that offer. Thank you so much for this. And it's a it's a two way process. You know, wherever we we engage, there's always a give and take. Uh, I think that spirit is great. Even later, if there's anything, we would love to uh, stay in touch with people in this audience. Uh, Srishti, would you quickly like to share where we are headed in the next few months? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here, being a part with us in this session. So right now we are just, uh, we have conducted a training need assessment with the local youth and mid-level officials of Uttar Kashi where we come to know that there is a a willingness to learn more how to uh, utilize these advisories and what the actions to be uh, like uh, managed and uh, strategically planning their further actions to uh, adapt against the climate uh, uh, these results that we they are facing but uh, they do have a knowledge the little bit knowledge but they are not able to uh, adapt that and uh, adopt their in uh, daily basis life so this is how we key uh, we able to know the key findings how they uh, what are the specific what are the gaps that we should address in their existing knowledges and accordingly we developed a training module for them like it's it's more sort of a training of a trainers and uh, they accordingly how the basic ones they will get to know about the climate change and what are the climate information services what are the abilities on ground what uh, what they can utilize more and effectively this is how we are going to plan if we are going to uh, change or anyone can get benefited of <coughs> this climate information services and we can make a valuable change in their lives that is our main motive in our coming phase we are going to uh, like doing this by a capacity building sessions that um, they are uh, being a part of it we are identifying we, we are hoping our vision is to develop a climate fellow cadre of uh, young fellows that uh, take this forward like it can be replicated and uh, being uh, to other states as well they can address the climate change effects that they are facing in their day to day life so this is our main motive to make change in the uh, life of the people of Uttarakashi and uh, Sikkim. Yeah, this is what right now we are hoping and we have the vision. Thank you. Thank you, Srishti. So as you hear, it's pretty open-ended. It is ambitious. Uh, Srishti, Prakhar, Anant and I are from STS Global. We'll be around for the next five minutes after this. Happy to uh, exchange numbers and stay in touch. Yes, sir. So uh, I'm happy to offer you if you want to make the, any key messages of your studies in terms of the warning and you want to validate that in other geographic regions, Perfect. With other concerned settings, I can help you do that. Thank you Thank so you much, much for that. We'll certainly take upon that offer. Thank you so much for that. The last thing, uh, so we just jumped into this session. Um, We didn't really introduce uh, people on the dais and all ourselves. We would have loved to do that. It's just that we were running so late, it would have taken so much time. Let's, let's, those of us who can spend time, let's mingle a bit after this session for a few minutes. But let me tell you that uh, Professor Ian Davis set up the first master's degree course in disaster management uh, in the world at Cranfield uh, many years ago. And, and it would be right to introduce you as the first professor of disaster management in the world, Ian. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think so. That, that's how I think of uh, Professor Ian Davis. 
Here you've seen, so it would be what, 40 odd years of yeah. uh, the sector? 48. 48 years. Yeah. Uh, almost 50 years. So you've seen, you've seen disaster management evolve as a discipline and this community grow for almost 50 years. Based on the based on the trend that you've seen, if we were to ask you a question which is partly in the fiction world, where do you think we will go in the next 50 years? What can we hope for for our children? What, what would you bet on? Where do you see this discipline go in the future? I've never been asked that, ever. There's not a question you can't answer. I think we go and have a meal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe just just to start with, when when I got involved in 1972, 71, um, it was a very small business. DRR was not talked about. Well, it wasn't. It was talked about in in different ways. I mean, for example, as a practicing architect, we did DRR every day. We designed buildings to resist wind. We designed buildings to resist fire, extra staircases, all sorts of fire resistant doors. You know, we architects think disasters. It's part of their training. So there's nothing new about that to me. DRR was simply an extension of what we did. But um, the community was very, very small of people involved in DRR. There were plenty of relief officials dealing with disaster relief. But there were certain professions that DRR was, the, was their job. Earthquake engineers. There are an enormous number of people who have been to earthquake engineers conferences. One in Vancouver, there were 8,000 people there. 700 came from Japan to that meeting, 700. Uh, the, these are, and that profession, earthquake engineering, is, is, is a huge branch of engineering. That is all they do. They design buildings to resist earthquakes and they retrofit existing buildings. So, and, and you could argue that a lot of the medical professions are the DRR people. Anyone involved in preventive medicine is basically a DRR professional. So there, there are people who do it as part of their day-to-day -day work. But if I project forward, I think we're going to live in a very, in a, in a pretty dangerous world. I think the risks are probably increasing faster than the understanding of them and they're probably dealing faster than the resources to deal with them. We found that with COVID, and we're probably finding it more and more with climate change. Um, so there's gonna to have to be, it's a pretty dangerous world for people. I think we're going to have to spend a lot more time and effort in helping children understand risks and helping them as they go on through their student years, understanding a bit more about risk and how it relates to their families and their behavior and so on, right up the whole ladder, risk will become much more part of education. I think that's one thing I hope will happen. And I think it probably will. It won't just be about children learning a bit about sexual health and about public health. It will be about protecting their, themselves and their friends and their families. And any responsible education system will take that on board. And it will have the byproduct of teaching them a lot about other disciplines, about health management, about biology, about, um, about basically about risk assessment. So that education, I think, will be one big, big factor in it all. Um, I suspect that in the future, data is going to become more and more our bread and butter. AI, I don't know what's going to happen with AI. Does anybody know what's going to happen with AI? I put into, into uh, my into my question, writing an essay, what has been the contribution of Ian Davis to disaster shelter? And the answer came back, we are unable to answer this question, which was, which was very wise. That cut me down to size. I thought, I, they, 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 nobody can answer that question. And, and, but what is, the, what is going to be the future of our world which, where you've got automatic uh, knowledge at a fingertip and you can do a huge amount of work by robots What's going to be, how are robots going to be helping us in this whole process? Um, I mean, remarkable progress. I mean, for many years, for example, we were playing about with attaching cameras to model aircraft to do aerial surveys of earthquake damage. That was in the pre-drone period. Just imagine what's, what's actually happened with drones. In Christchurch, New Zealand, 
there's a cathedral which is at risk of collapse. They're flying drones through the broken windows inside the building, surveying the whole structure and the, the, and the analysis of this, which nobody dared get inside because it was imminently going to fall down. But you can send a drone in, it doesn't matter, that gets smashed up. And, and just imagine that, that that kind of massive, wonderful development which has happened, which is for the good of everybody. So I think I have a lot of trust in technology, I think. It needs a, a very, very hefty degree of control and management. And I hope that we don't let the, the, the techno people take over. They, they need to listen and learn from the humanities about what to do and what not to do. And they need a very healthy dose of ethics in, the whole, in every single aspect of what they're doing. Ethical control has got to be built into it. Um, I, 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 just, I, I think in the future world, there will be some big, big benefits happening. I think we'll be able to manage a lot more effectively things like um, I think that some, of the, some of the earthquakes, the, some of the warning systems for volcanoes, for floods, for, um, for impending cyclonic winds, they're going to get better and better and better, those. And I think with cell phones, we're going to get information to people. One of the, my extraordinary results was to go to Haiti after the earthquake and to find out that 97% of all Haitians had mobile phones, cell phones. 98%. That's one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. Now, how, did, how, how could that happen? So how did they use the phones? Well, the answer is they managed their own relief programs. Many, many of those people had Haitian friends in New York City or Toronto or Miami or, or in Europe and they get on the phone immediately and said, I need money from American Express now and they would go to the American Express, receive the money, buy tools, and start working on their house within one hour of, of the earthquake happening. Money was flowing and people were... Now this was completely unprecedented. People managing their own relief programs. So I think that, that process will, in, will increase. Another question we, I found the answer to after Haiti was that when I worked in Kobe after the earthquake in 94, um, I was commissioned by the Ministry of Housing to do a study of where people moved, where did they go to? 350,000 people left Kobe and they don't know where they went. Did they go to relatives? Did they go to Osaka? Did they go to Yokohama? Or where did they go in Japan? They don't know. But, but in Haiti they knew exactly where they went because they had mobile phone tracking records. And the Swedish university started looking at the tracking, and that, that's really precious information. Yes. Wonderful. And it probably, I don't know what the ethics were of finding out that information, but, but it, it gives you knowledge. Now you can direct, if you've got that information, you're a good government, you could direct aid to them and say, OK, we know that you've moved here. If you, fo if you contact this number, we can give you a support. Don't come back. Don't come back yet. Stay with your brother-in-law for this amount of time because we're not ready for you back. We want, but we'd like you back. But we'll give you money, or we'll give your host family money. So now the agencies could help that evacuation process, which is eventually beneficial because it means that you can you can depopulate the area that's devastated, and you can get on with life while these people are away being looked after. And you're going to be much better looked after by your brother-in-law than by some anonymous relief official because he looks after you, he's, he's part of your family. So why not use the, use the coping mechanism as, as a resource and use technology to help you do it? So I think there's some really great benefits happening, but I, I, I hate to think what, how wrong this advice is in another. I'll be dead and gone by then, you'll be alive, but I, I, I don't know how it will be in another 48 years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian, for that. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, it's a question that bothers me a lot, uh, more so in the last uh, eight years. Uh, I, I've been one of, uh, most of us in this sector have been in some ways or the other EN students. Uh, that was my first project that I referred to, which I learned a lot from EN on and then, then onwards too. So I've been working in this sector for close to 30 years, but in the year 2015, my daughter was born, who's eight now. And in 2015, my dad turned 85. 
and 2015 air pollution was pretty bad in Delhi and the first thing that I struggled with was a was an infant who was struggling with the air pollution so besides installing uh, air purifiers I, I, I went completely nuts buying all kinds of equipment measuring air pollution at different points in the city different points in the building and so on but what hit me was that my dad had just turned 85 he's very fit uh, thank god he's very able he moves around very active reads writes uh, very independent so my daughter would turn 85 in the year 2100 and hopefully if all stays well and with improved medical uh, facilities she would be pretty fit and, and moving around and doing stuff but I have no clue what the world will look like or what Delhi will be like we don't have a plan I'm a trained urban planner but Delhi has a draft plan for the year 2040 it has a vision for 2050 it has nothing beyond 2050 right and, and and it's it's a bit bit alarming that you know for for children who are around us for kids who are in elementary school today for whom 2100 is a real figure we have we have no intentions of thinking about that year right now so on on that uh, note which which shows us hope with the technology and hopefully with wisdom but it also is a scary future with the kind of risks that are evolving around us with the kind of silos that are strengthening, with the kind of individual isolation that is growing in society, uh, it's a complex future for our children and for children who are not yet born in this world. Uh, hopefully we'll try and work harder, uh, have this conversation going and uh, figure out ways for something slightly better for them. Thank you very much ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for staying with us. It's a late session. We really appreciate it. Uh, we are here for a few minutes. Happy to chit chat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We should take a picture. Can you please? Anand, can you? Durgesh Pat, Director General, Uttarakhand, Science and Technology Council, Post Dehradun. Today, the world needs disaster preparedness, disaster resilience, climate action and science and technology centric disaster management systems. In Uttarakhand Devabhumi, we are organizing the 6th World Congress on Disaster Management from 28th of November to 1st of December. This 6th World Congress will have people from across the world, those who are practitioners, those who are researchers, those who are scientists, those who are stakeholders, those who are working in different domains of disaster management. So they will all come over. This is going to be one single platform where everybody will deliberate, where every one will come together and put forward a comprehensive viewpoint with regard to disaster management, its resilience and action plan too. Do come over. Thank you so much. Namaskar.